the, uh, through the program we have today and in the gathering minutes uh, tomorrow and on Wednesday, uh, I will show the, the remaining program to keep it short today. Um, I hope you are all in the Slack. Uh, if not, um, and you have trouble joining, just let me know, I can help you because uh, all the material, everything will be there, also the discussion. Our great pleasure is to have three invited keynote speakers. We are starting just in a few minutes with the first um, given by Ivona Brandich on data science driven methods for sustainable and failure tolerant edge systems. Tomorrow in the evening, uh, we have John Wilkes from Google. Um, so it's not at uh, a 2 p.m., it's a 5 p.m. keynote. And on Wednesday, we have again a 2 p.m. European time keynote um, from uh, Long Xiang Li working at Inspur. So our industry keynote um, on performance optimization of HPC applications in large scale clusters. Um, I want to share a few stats on uh, how the reviewing went and the submissions. So we had in the research track 38 uh, submissions. We were able to accept full nine, uh, nine full papers and four short papers. And we had a very strong industry experience track this year with 20 submissions um, and we're able to accept um, five full papers here and four short papers, which brings us to a joint acceptance rate of 24%, 24% and including the short papers of both track, uh, tracks, we have 38%. This was only possible with our big um, program committee 80 persons uh, really did an awesome job providing constructive feedback. Um, I checked the number of total reviews we have in EasyChair, it's 290 plus reviews um, and not counting even the workshops. And in the main tracks, most papers even got four reviews. We have one more new thing be, besides uh, that we introduced double blind review mode. Um, we have for the very first time, we have um, a data challenge track. Um, the four accepted data challenge papers will be discussed uh, tomorrow at 4 p.m. CST. And this track was organized by David Daly, Corpol Bissemer and Waichi Shang and did with data donated by MongoDB. So I'm really happy to have this enriching the um, ICPE conference from this year, for this year. This brings us to the program for today. So we will start in a, in a few minutes with uh, the keynote by Ivona Brandich. Uh, we have a 10 minutes break. The first technical session on service and cloud computing, which is roughly one hour. Then we have another 10 minutes break, um, having the second session on GPUs and heterogeneous platforms, a very a short break to start into a poster and demo session and uh, also with a virtual socializing corner. Um, and this session is then organized in breakout rooms after we see a number of pitches. So now I would like to hand over for, um, short word um, to Arthur, our local chair from Inspur. Um. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Arthur Ken from Inspur. And also is, uh, I'm a local uh, chair of this conference. Uh, we are very sorry to not make our final goals to bring everybody here in Beijing, but uh, as a local team of this, of this conference, we are very honored and proud to, be, to participate in this uh, preparation work of this conference. And uh, since this is the first ICP conference uh, held in China, so we are very grateful to ACM and SPEC for creating a very excellent opportunity to provide to provide a wonderful platform for Chinese academic talents and related practitioners to communicate with their international co-workers. And uh, thank you again to create this uh, 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 very uh, wonderful platforms. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. With this, we are a few minutes ahead of time. Um, and I, I want to say have fun at ICPE and 
um, I look forward to interacting with you live or and in Slack. Yes, thanks everybody. Welcome also from my side. So I'm Philipp Leitner, I'm the other VC co-chair. Uh, and I have kind of the most pleasurable task in, in this welcome session because I have the pleasure of introducing our first keynote speaker. Uh, but before I do that, I think uh, it's now is a good time to start talking a little bit about some, some administrative things. I'm assuming all of you have very detailedly read the conference guide that we sent out and all of you are completely aware of how we want to do this, but still I, I let's let's use the first keynote session that we're going to have now to kind of try trial how try out how we are going to run the conference uh, in the next three days. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to start with our first keynote in. Uh, we're going to start with our first keynote in a couple of minutes and. While we listen to the very interesting presentation, you can already go to Slack and you can post your questions in the right Slack channel. You can also look at what other questions other people have asked and you can use reactions in Slack, thumbs up, heart, whatever kind of floats your boat, whatever is kind of most representative of your feelings about the question to indicate that you're also very interested in that question. And then at the end of the session, we will of course have a quality uh, a, a Q and A block and I will, I will call on you to ask your questions live on 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 uh, on Zoom, so you will uh, unmute and 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 ask your question to the keynote speaker. And I will do that roughly in the order of you know how much reactions and uh, how much interest the questions have gotten in Slack. So uh, you can basically use uh, emojis to 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 say that you're also very interested in a specific question. Uh, we are not gonna have. Uh, we're going to have the chat disabled in uh, Zoom, as you probably noticed, and this is mostly because we really want to have the text discussion in Slack, because there other people can also follow it, and there you can also, we can also archive it. Okay, so with that out of the way, um, let me introduce our first keynote speaker, um, and please join me all in welcoming Professor Imona Brandic from the Vienna University of Technology. And uh, Professor Brandic is a professor of high performance computing, and her research interests are in large scale and distributed systems. And oftentimes her research is really focused on two things, I would say, quality of service and especially energy efficiency. Uh, and I think this is also what she's going to talk to us about today. Um, so Professor Brandic is the recipient of quite a few awards and honors including probably most importantly, the FWF Start Prize, which if you're not Austrian, uh, this is the most prestigious award for young research scientists. And it's very rarely given to computer scientists as far as I know. Um, and she has also received a Distinguished Young Scientist Award from TU Vienna. Um, her presentation today will be on a very, very timely topic, namely on sustainable and fault tolerant edge systems. So with that, Please join me and welcome Professor Ivona Brandic to ICP 2022. Ivona, the floor is yours. Unfortunately, ima imagine us clapping. We can't really do this very well virtually, but you know the truth. So hello, uh, good morning, good afternoon. Um, I hope you can see me. I hope you can hear me. Um, First of all, thank you very much for this uh, very kind uh, introduction and also uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm very, very happy to give this keynote and also to um, give you the insights into the methods that we are using for um, development of failure tolerant edge systems and we use um, data science uh, driven methods. So, um, when talking about the um, resilience uh, of edge systems and uh, sustainability of systems in general, I would like uh, to just uh, give a brief overview of uh, problems that we have nowadays. And the biggest problem that we have is the paradigm shift in the software development that we have. Um, if you think um, about the, I would say, uh, traditional software development, um, methods where we have data and rules as inputs, and then where we have software engineers developing the problem programs, we get the answers. 
Right. So what is changed today is the way how our programs are developed. We have a input data and answers, right? And if I'm, for example, driving self-driving car, I know the answer. I don't want to hit the wall. What I don't know is uh, the rule, how to avoid hitting the, the wall. And that's what we have to learn using AI and machine learning systems. So what is the downside of those systems? Well, they are, most of them are time sensitive. If you look here, smart grid, intelligent traffic control, self-driving cars, they are data intensive. In most cases, geographically distributed and non-stationary. That means um, if I learn a rule and the situation changes or the data distribution changes, I have to learn it again. And this results in energy intensive systems and in particular in the explosion of energy demands that we have for our, uh, for our ICT systems. And I think one of the very nice uh, pictures uh, showing that development is this one. It is from Nature article in 2018. And what you can see here, here we have the timeline and here uh, we have the projected uh, energy um, efforts that we will need for our ICT infrastructures. And there are some very interesting developments that you can observe here. On the one hand, if you look the, the red area here, the energy for the production of ICT is going to stay nearly the same over years. Consumer devices are going to consume even less energy than now because- Hello everyone, uh, I'm Rizwan Eshref. And you today you? I'll be presenting uh, my work with Roberto Gayosa from Pacific Northwest National Lab. Uh, this present- Okay, um, so uh, I was, I think, in the yellow area. Uh, and the consumer devices are going to be even smaller and more energy efficient, even though we have more of them. So you see the energy is going to decrease here. But there are two developments uh, where we uh, definitely see the explosion of energy demands. The green one means the energy demands for data centers because we have everything in our data centers. We use cloud computing, we store our pictures, everything uh, in cloud data centers, and we have to access those pictures. We stream everything. We stream also this keynote today, right? So the demand for the network is also going to explode. And what I also want to say, the predictions were done before the pandemic. So I think this is going to be even worse than predicted here. So um, this is in general the development of ICT. We have another development and this development means um, that we have increasing amount of applications that constantly produce data and where the data have to be immediately processed. And this is one of such examples. This video is provided to me by Hannes Kaufmann. Hannes Kaufmann is a colleague of mine from TU Wien. And you see a multi-user virtual reality environment where people can be at five different continents, but using this software, they think they're in the same room. And why I'm showing you that is basically this equipment here. So you can see the glasses here, and you can see a number of sensors that are tracking the movement of the body and creating such images and basically based on the data that we get from the sensors uh, we have to create around 50 images per second um, otherwise the quality of the video is not good enough and in order to do that you can see that this lady she's wearing a laptop on her backpack and this is the reality yeah, that we have uh, nowadays. That means we produce huge amounts of data that have to be produced immediately at the same place uh, where the data is produced because of the low latency requirement. And this is just one application. There are many of them uh, that work in, I would say, very similar way. So what is happening now uh, in our environment we have to process data where the data is produced. So we have data centers basically everywhere. I have on this slide just a few of them, few types of data centers. So you can see we put data centers even underwater. It is experimental development by Microsoft, but still 
there are uh, different research directions to put our data center underwater to save cooling costs, plus half of the world population is living in coastal areas, so putting data center underwater near coastal areas means we achieve also low latency. Huawei micro data center that you can put into the corner of your office, so you have your data very close to you. Raspberry Pi gateway, um, you can call it also first hop data center. You can use it for very simple but well powerful computation like data staging or pre-processing. High latitude data centers, liquid cooling data centers. So what I'm trying to tell you here is that data centers are very heterogeneous. They have different forms and flavors and it is increasingly difficult to manage them. And the failures are going to be, and they are now, a big issue because in such hyper-heterogeneous environment, I would say, failures are not exception anymore. They happen on the regular base and you have to deal with that. You have to learn how to deal with that. And as I said, um, virtual reality is just one application um, that we called new real-time system where we have to process data immediately as they are produced. There are many such systems, for example, vehicular networking, cyber physical systems, um, personalized medicine, it's a big topic, hot topic today, um, robots, steering of robots. All of them, they have in common that they have very low latency and they usually don't have the uh, facilities to process all the data on board of the end device, right? So what we do here, we offload data to massive data centers, like big data analysis, storage services for archiving, GPU VMs. And if they are not uh, close enough, and usually such massive data centers are not close enough, so we have to use the facilities that we have around us um, we can use uh, routers, switches, and if they are not powerful enough, so we install so-called micro data centers or edge data centers. It can be a Raspberry Pi underwater data center. It can be a um, micro, Huawei micro data center. And uh, such infrastructure are really difficult to uh, develop in a um, failure tolerant way because failures can happen everywhere. They can happen here, they can happen here, they can happen here. And um, my research is basically focused on developing resilience methods, in particular focusing on the edge data centers. And there are different techniques and methods that we can use here. And I, would, uh, I will show today um, a method for system-based resilience based on um, data and um, experience and evidence. So, uh, why are failures so difficult to manage on the edge? Well, first of all, we have extreme low latency here. That means um, we don't have time to use traditional approaches like retry or checkpointing or something like that. Uh, we have different types of failures. Plus, we have unstructured, dynamic and heterogeneous infrastructures. As I said, we cannot use the traditional approaches. Plus, usually we don't have uh, the traditional support systems like diesel generators, fully duplicated electrical lines, all those things that you have in traditional data centers. Plus, uh, what we have here, if you consider such example, where we have geographically distributed um, edge servers, server two, one, and three, um, we have um, new type of failures called spatial temporal dependencies uh, that appear in geographically distributed systems. And I will explain later what that means. And we have to consider that when developing failure tolerance system. So what uh, do I mean with spatial temporal dependencies? Assume now three servers here. So, and server two and server one have the same power supply. So if the power supply fail, both servers will fail concurrently. Server three and server one, they have the same wireless access. So if the wireless access fails, server one and server three can still operate, but they cannot send data and receive data. And there is another dependency. We have a rule that if server two fails, the workload is redistributed to server one and server three. So if server two fails at time point T, 
because of the workload redistribution and the overload, um, server one and server three fail. And we don't know that. Those dependencies are don't know. We don't know it at runtime. We can observe it over time and learn from the past. And this is very critical issue because usually we have very strict requirements on such systems like availability of 99.99% of the time. So what can we do here? If we want to deploy now two replicas, let's say C1 and C2 at server one and server three, we want to make sure that they are not going to fail at the same time, right? Otherwise, the effects of having a replica are nullified. And there are methods to deal with such uh, non-deterministic dependencies in system. We know it and um, we use it. It is, I would say, common knowledge for computer scientists. If you look at this graph here, uh, we have dependencies for a small system, a laptop or a desktop computer. If you have power outage, then the hard disk failure happens. We have reduced availability and it affects our operating system. So we have failure of our operating system. If operating system fails, we have reduced availability of our system, but the hard disk is not affected, um, and so on. That means we can represent dependencies using graphical structures where the nodes uh, represent possible failures and uh, we can combine them with um, links that represent dependencies. And this is a typical, um, I would say, um, yeah, failure dependency graph for the small systems. And this is easy to grow because it's common knowledge. But let's now imagine having a cluster with uh, three and a half thousand servers. And even in such cluster, there are dependencies. There might be um, nodes or servers that fail concurrently all the time. It happens all the time. We don't know why, but it happens. And we can even uh, in such large systems, we can model that and see and uh, learn when those failure happens by analyzing the failure traces like we, can, like we have, have here on this picture. So you can see here we have a particular node name and then we have event type. So if we have zero, we know, okay, the failure happens. We can track the start time of the failure and stop time of the failure and so on. And then we can even uh, connect the same um, uh, time, um, time units and uh, see, okay, uh, combine them if, for example, we get failures in consecutive time steps, right? So instead of modeling the failures through common knowledge, we can learn such huge graphs by analyzing the um, logs, right? And we can model uh, failures that happen concurrently, but also, as I said, by tracking the time steps, we can model also failures in consecutive time steps. We have to learn it, we have to analyze um, such files, we have to learn probabilities, and we have also to learn evidence. We have to learn the structure of such graph, and we have also to learn the conditional probability tables. Now, um, server and cluster is one thing. Another thing is also that we have such dependencies in smart traffic systems. Uh, we learned that also in our um, intrasafe project that was uh, financed by City of Vienna, where we won 5G challenge, and we developed an app where you can, um, how to say, uh, avoid several accidents. For example, if you have here right turn, and um, you cannot see this bicycle driver or a child or a pet, uh, we can observe certain region of the street uh, with um, camera and uh, with uh, Raspberry Pi, then identify objects of interest and the objects are sent as notification via 5G to the navigator app of the car so that they can react even before they see the child on the street, right? So if you want to implement such systems, um, you have to have such smart traffic lights. And in Vienna, we have many of them. But the thing is, you want to know if some of them are going to fail or under which conditions are they going to fail? Or you want to infer about the future 
failure probability, right? So in order to do that, we can also model it using non-deterministic dependencies. And we developed um, automatic graph learning approach for spatial temporal failure dependencies as shown in this picture. Um, and as I said, it, it is based on um, dynamic Bayesian networks, where we in the first step analyze failure monitors. So we have files, huge files, comma separated files, where we extract the dependency graphs. So we extract such graphs. This would be the dependency graph for this very simple example. So we learn the graph. And then in the next step, we learn the conditional probability tables, right? We, le we learn G and theta. This is our graph with probabilities. Now, once we have those probabilities, if you look here at this line, we can say, um, what is the probability to have failure at um, node one, if, for example, node two fails in previous time step and uh, node three fails in the current time step? So we can infer about that, right? So this is what we do in the first step. And in order to uh, avoid noisy systems, we uh, limit our learning on concurrent failures and on cascading failures, uh, where we have Markov lag of one. That means we can we consider consecutive uh, time steps here. Now, in the next step, uh, we want now to infer failure probability. We want to do uh, inference. Um, we have, let's say, a candidate. Um, for the deployment of replicas, which are S1 and S3. And uh, we want to know how big is the probability that they are going to fail at the same time step. OK, so uh, in order to do that, um, you know, such graphs can be really huge. I mean, this is a very simple example, but you can have thousands of nodes. And doing inference in such huge graphs, um, it's an NP-hard problem, and it can take forever. So what we do first, we try to um, create ancestral graph of the nodes of interest and leave all other nodes out. I mean, in this example, yeah, it's um, obvious um, that ancestral graph is relatively huge, uh, considered uh, and comparing to the remaining graph. But usually, it would be the opposite, right? It would be very small comparing to the overall graph structure. And then we do variable elimination technique, uh, means uh, we try to reduce number of summation steps where we try to not to calculate from the left to the right, but we calculate from right to the left so that we can reduce some terms. And then in the next step, if we send the candidate deployment pair, let's say C1 and C2, we get as the output the probability that the both servers S1 and S3 are going to fail uh, at the same time point or in consecutive time points. So um, in the next step, what we have here is basically our programming interface. Now, the software developer can develop different algorithms to uh, develop, um, let's say, replicas. We can iterate multiple number of replicas until we reach certain um, failure probability or until we reach certain um, availability that we want to have from those services. And this can be also a part of, let's say, a Kubernetes cluster, or it can be an interface to Kubernetes cluster where you can implement um, specific scheduling failure tolerant um, mechanisms for the deployment. OK, um, we have um, proved many of aspects of the um, failure tolerance um, data science driven failure tolerance theoretically, but we also did experimental evaluations as well. Um, in particular, we used our um, real link failure data sets from IntraSafe project that I already mentioned, where we had around 25,000 messages um, that were sent between Galaxy 5G smartphone and Kubernetes cluster consisting of 12 Raspberry Pi nodes. We collected data over a period of four days. And we consider all messages that have response or runtime time uh, larger than, uh, let's say, half a second as a failure. And in our data sets, um, around two and a half percent of all messages are considered to be a failure. Um, for the evaluation, we use um, 
simulation of barbazi albert skill free network generation uh, that is really suitable to simulate human made networks where we have preferential node setting and also hub development and we used uh, quite heterogeneous um, nodes uh, considering availability we used um, something uh, very similar to the in internet infrastructure LDNS, where we have very high availability, but also very high round trip time. Then we used, um, for example, Skype super nodes that have a uh, um, lower availability, but also lower uh, round uh, trip time. And then we used also ordinary client devices at as edge node. I use, we use just ordinary smartphones um, that have, of course, very low availability because uh, they have sometimes resources, sometimes not, but they have very low round trip time around one millisecond. And you can see here uh, the server lifetime availability that we use for our experiments. We did also very extensive uh, evaluations here, but just to show you um, how um, reliable our approach is, here we have the service downtime uh, based on the task length using internet-based infrastructure, business um, infrastructure, and device infrastructures. So you can see that compared to other approaches where we have random selection of edge nodes or where we consider only previous failure without any dependency analysis um, our approach which is dependency and failure resilient approach um, has no service downtime at all for reliable infrastructure but even though for um, unreliable infrastructure like client devices and smartphones we have um, not more than two, two percent outage um, of our services so it seemed to be um, and to outperform all um, baseline algorithms that we were using here um, the approach that i'm uh, showing here uh, is one of the major outcomes of the fwf uh, project um, which was the start price and uh, the major outcome is also published in transactions and parallel and distributed systems um, in the paper learning spatial temporal failure dependency for resilient edge computing services with my colleague Atta Kanarai. But based on this, um, I would say foundational method, we have uh, developed different other um, strategies for utilizing data science driven um, fault tolerance that also results in increased sustainability in different other areas and i'm just going to show you some of the application areas of uh, fault tolerance mechanisms that i have shown you uh, now here one um, application area is in geographically distributed machine learning in, um, I would say, um, utilized for climate change and monitoring of environmental infrastructures. Um, what you can see on this picture, it is a um, picture of Ambanaya River in Norilsk in Siberia. And they had a um, diesel outage um, because one of these diesel tanks leaked and this happens very frequently in this area because of the towning of the permafrost. So the soil is moving and they have significant damage of the facilities. Um, in this picture, you can see the diesel because it's red, but usually um, dangerous substances might leak. Karzogen substances, substances that you cannot smell, you cannot see. And in our um, Chist Era project, Spain, sustainable watershed management through IoT driven artif artif artificial intelligence, we try to monitor such rivers um, in order to sense pollutants. And this is very tricky because what I learned from biologists, you can sense only something if you know what are you looking for. So what we have to develop here are so-called micro fingerprints. Um, we have to observe water, uh, develop fingerprints of all substances that you can find here in case of leakage to be able to sense it on time and to report it to authorities. So what we do here, basically, we develop um, yeah, artificial intelligence based model of a river where you can infer upstream and if you detect something, you can then infer and say what is the most probable 
reason for the leakage, which facility, but you can also infer downstream and say what would be the effect of this pollutant to agriculture or to drinking water. And here you have really, really a lot of problems with sustainability because there is no cloud, no edge, there is nothing. We are in outback here. We have problems like sensors are sometimes eaten by the animals. So try to model that with um, traditional failed failure tolerance model. But with evidence base, it's easy. If sensors are disappearing, you can model that, you can put cages and, and things like that. So it's a very flexible model to um, model um, um, fault tolerance also in geographically distributed and very unreliable systems. Another application area of um, data science driven uh, fault tolerance for edge systems is code of loading. And I have multiple projects on code of loading. One of them is Marie Curie Fellowship Project um, for a quality of service aware um, multi clouds, where we uh, try to develop models for code of loading of end devices that, are, that don't have enough computational resources to execute certain tasks. This is typically uh, in case of drones because they cannot carry heavy weight. Uh, so you cannot put um, powerful servers on your drones, but also for very uh, simple tasks like um, face recognition on your smartphone. Imagine you use your smartphone um, to open the door. If the face is recognized, the door is open. And this can take sometimes minutes to um, process on the smartphone. What we can do is offload such tasks to edge nodes. And uh, luckily, most of such applications, like, for example, for um, face recognition or for the navigator or uh, for the trajectory prediction for uh, drones, are described as uh, directed acyclic graphs. And what we use here, we try to identify the um, computation intensive tasks. This would be, for example, in case of navigator path calculation and to offload it to the nearby edge nodes, right? This would be, for example, awesome if you are running out of battery and you, you still want to use your navigator app, right? And here you can see um, our first um, experimental development uh, that we used uh, for our um, Raspberry Pi cluster. We used this development where we have four edge nodes. Um, we have also cloud backend. We have, here is the, the smartphone. And we compare it directly uh, with the performance of the Kubernetes scheduler. And even though we have this data science driven um, resilience based um, offloading, where we have to guess the availability of edge nodes, we are able to have comparable performance with the standard um, Kubernetes scheduler. And this is just published a few, I think, a few days ago at um, EdgeSys. Uh, 2022. And the last um, application area that I want to show you here um, is the fault tolerance in microgrid management, which is super complicated. If you look here, in case of microgrid management, we have actors. We have, for example, a photovoltaic um, devices. We have homes with photovoltaic. We have uh, battery clusters. All of those devices act as agents, and uh, the agents communicate um, to the main grid and to the um, energy trading platform. And you can imagine this is a very economically, but also technologically complicated system, because you have parameter server, you have to collect data from all those devices. And Failure happens. We are here also again in geographically, highly geographically distributed systems, failure happens. And if many um, entities here don't communicate on time, the whole system can get completely unstable and crash. So what we uh, developed here, I'm not going to explain this in detail, but just the um, idea how it works, every of those items acts as an agent, right? And the agent learn how to behave using deep reinforcement learning, and they communicate with, with each other with Q values. And the Q values tell us about the possible actions um, and the possible outcome of the actions. For example, if you buy energy or if you sell energy to the main grid. 
But then in case of failures, the agents don't communicate Q values and everything can crash. So what we use here is again, Bayesian belief update. So we try to guess what would be the Q value and what would be the action of the agents here. So instead of um, trying to model the availability of certain nodes, physical nodes of the edge infrastructure, here we try to uh, model the availability of Q values, which is actually the communication parameter between the agents. So this is just another application area of uh, data science driven full tolerance that also results in sustainable systems. So I hope I was able to give you an overview um, about uh, the I would say the core idea, but also about the possible applications. Um, you know, to summarize uh, my talk, um, well, in geographically distributed systems like edge systems, sustainability is difficult because um, failure happens and the failure have, we have to manage failure in a way so that it does not affect timeliness of the systems. What I have shown today are machine learning approaches to integrate failures into the system and to act um, in a, I would say, proactive way instead of a reactive way like most systems do. Um, we have used um, machine learning techniques uh, for the edge where we try to predict failures and also to deploy uh, tasks and systems in a way that the failure does not affect us much. The question is, um, what are the further challenges? Um, we are, I was talking here about the internet infrastructure, but what if we include satellite communication? I was assuming here the classical von Neumann architecture, but what if we have hyper-heterogeneous architectures, including quantum, neuromorphic computing. So the things are getting even more complex, I think. And there are many, many more things to do uh, in order to facilitate sustainability. Um, what I just want to point um, is uh, the tutorials. Um, what I have shown today, we have also given tutorial at ES week 2021. So if you really want to use such bold tolerance techniques for your system, um, feel free to check uh, videos. Um, I'm giving some theoretical introduction and Michael Gata Panaral hands on tutorials. So feel free to check that and also come back to us if you have any questions. Um, thank you very much for um, all your, um, yeah, passions and listening to this um, keynote and I'm very happy to now answer your questions if there are some. Thank you so much Ivona. Um, we have a question by Manoj in the chat. <clears throat> Manoj, do you want to unmute and ask your question or should I ask it for you? Uh, no, sure. I can, uh, I can uh, ask. Am, am, am I audible? Yes, you are. Hi. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so, so my, my question was, I mean, you showed that graph where uh, you showed the traces and the uh, probabilities that were inferred from the traces. I wanted to know, was the graph also uh, learned or was it like you, you assumed a certain uh, structure of the, mm -hmm. of the fault graph? Yeah. Um, well, um, we have to balance here um, the learning effort and also the accuracy. So what we cannot do is to assume completely random graph structure. So we assume um, tree structure and I'm not sure we have the, the, the how many um, nodes we have, I think four or five are the maximum span of the, of the three. So we have certain limitations on the, on the graph structure that we allow. Um, and we have also certain limitations on the possible failures that we learn about. So we consider also, I, I, I think I mentioned that as well, 
we consider only concurrent and time and failures in consecutive time steps. Otherwise, um, the, the, the learning effort would explode. And the other thing is we did also experiments um, with um, yeah, more complex tree structures, but then you capture so much noise. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. So there is another question by Heng Li. Uh, do you want to ask your question directly or should I ask? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so my my question is, uh, I, is, is there any open data associated with associated with uh, the, the tutorial that you mentioned uh, like a, a, in the slides? Um, you have to check it in the tutorial. We have some parts, uh, some parts are available, especially for the learning of the graphs. Um, we also discuss which tools did we use. So um, it, it's explained in, in the tutorial how to, what you can use and, and how to use it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. There are more questions for Ivona. Samuel, you, I saw that you just posted a question. Yeah. Yeah, I did something. Thank you very much, Ivona, for a very nice uh, presentation. My question was, you mentioned these failure graphs mm -hmm. and how they propagate. And uh, there are different types of failures and different semantics associated. For example, if something crashes or something provides erroneous results or it just does not respond, mm -hmm. what kind of models do you assume here of the failures? Yeah, uh, we have very, very, I would say, simple <laughs> uh, failure model. It's binary. <laughs> Our failure model is binary. It works or it doesn't work. Zero or one. And everything is based on that. You know, the server is working or not. Zero and working, or one. Working means it replies to a given uh, check yeah. or something yes. like heartbeat, yes. whatever. Yes. Um, is it alive or not, right? I see. Mm -hmm. So, and everything is built around that, um, this um, zero one model. I mean, it's very rudimentary, but because it's so rudimentary, it allows you to do a lot of things. <laughs> yes, I agree. And uh, maybe a follow up question. Sometimes it might be that several events in combination, so to say, interact, causing a given failure to happen at one point, right? Mm -hmm. So if you look at them individually, you cannot directly learn a dependency, but if you look at them as interaction, mm -hmm. for example, they, they fail at the same time or uh, during a given interval, then this causes, let's say, a given failure to appear. Mm -hmm. Do you support such more complex interactions between the failure types? Well, I think, this is captured in 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 this model as well right um i mean how to say um you you will discover that if you ask it if you ask okay um does do server one two three four five fail always at the same time the system can give you the answer if it happens and if it's tracked in the system but um, um, yeah, this is what we facilitated. So you want you want now to create more complex query and say uh, queries and to ask, let's say, are there five servers that always fail at the same time, or do, is it that what you mean? I mean, basically, to understand if a given combination of failures mm -hmm. occurring in a given time frame mm -hmm. is responsible for a given failure type. Let's say a server, I mean, sometimes it might be that, you know, it is only this combination which causes the, the failure of a given service. Mm -hmm. And uh, otherwise, I mean, it also is related to the, the problem with uh, sometimes, especially in the microservices area, mm -hmm. you have uh, fault tolerance mechanisms you have replicas, so it might be that you have multiple instances and they reply. So maybe 
you have multiple servers serving the same microservice uh, type, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it might be that only if all of these servers fail, the service is unavailable. Otherwise, there is always someone to take over, right? Ah, okay. This is what I didn't explain in the talk. This is the semantic that you define. Um, what we allow here and assume is uh, different types of replicas. Um, there is a standby replica and uh, where you have, let's say you have five replicas and in order to say that service runs correctly, you need at least um, one. Or you can define in your, this is what you can define in your model. Uh, this is described in the paper very well. Or you can say we have active workload sharing replicas. You have n replicas, and in order to operate correctly, you need at least n to operate. Let's say you you have eight, you have ten replicas, but in order to operate correctly, you need at least five. And this is what you can model in your system beforehand. Right. What which type, which type of um, a replication system you use. This is something that you can um, define, right? You can also define uh, how you define how the how the path is defined between the services. Um, you can also I didn't didn't talk at all about link availability and link link fault. This is a um, problem on its own, but this is also possible to model it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, are there more questions for Ivona? Hi, I, I just want to ask a quick question. Uh, how do you collect all this data for uh, analyzing or research? Because um, when I was a student at that time, um, collecting data part is really uh, difficult. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, this was a big workaround <laughs> uh, that we that we did to collect such data. There are some um, publicly available re repositories that we have used, like University of Massachusetts. They have um, availability of um, smart home data that we uh, utilized here. So there there are there are data sets that you can use here, um, mm -hmm. and and we have it also described in our paper. Yeah, I'm happy to, to send you the links um, that we have used here. Um, but you have to do some work around um, because um, not all of them are actually edge systems. So we had to adapt a little bit um, the, um, um, the utilization of those data sets to be able to use it as kind of an edge node. This is really difficult. This is this is a big issue, right? Because also the companies um, are very reluctant to yes. um, to offer data sets, but we use um, academic data sets that are provided by other universities. Plus, we used our own data sets from Intrasec. We had to develop um, traffic lights, um, in intelligent traffic lights, and we collected a lot of data. So that's uh, how we also have um, also the traces for the evaluation. I see. This is very awesome. Yeah, thanks. Maybe a last question from my side. So how, how do you see in general the Internet of Things is kind of as an upcoming sort of trend? Because there's a lot of anticipation, but also a lot of concern in, in, in the community, not, not just, you know, our community, but I would say society in general. How do you see in general this, this trend towards edge and fog, fog computing? Are you concerned that we all going to be wired up in the future or is this something that you that you see positively um well i mean it, it's in our hands what what we do with this and um i, I think definitely this is going to develop in more, one way or another i see for example that the telco companies are quite real. i don't know how in other countries but in austria i don't see much 5g here i don't know how it's in sweden other countries what is the status 5G is coming, I would say. Yeah, it's coming yeah. in Sweden. We, we, we are the land of Ericsson, so yes, it is coming <laughs> one way or another. <laughs> um, yeah, um, we, we will see um, how this is um, going uh, to develop, but um, I think most of the applications uh, that are 
some uh, where we see a little bit stagnation right now uh, is because of the lack of the facilities and you know developing edge infrastructure means you have to put a lot of money <laughs> in it and i think this is the problem right now so the yeah, theoretically or, or practically, you have to equip every 5G antenna with some kind of computational infrastructure, and this is costly, you know, and um, this is, uh, I think, one of the critical issues. The another thing, because you mentioned um, safety and privacy issues, I think that I mean, this is also one of the reasons why edge computing was invented is that you can process data immediately at the place where they are produced and um, only aggregated data are leaving the, the, the space, right? So what we did, for example, for this intelligent traffic light, we count persons and we report, okay, um, how many e accidents or dangerous situations happens a day, but we don't transfer the uh, the images of the people or of the of the of the objects so you can um, anonymize the data immediately as they are produced and this is i think the benefit of edge computing i see it as a huge benefit because you can immediately process the data anonymize it and uh, the context information never leaves the place where the data are processed Very interesting. Thank you so much, Ivona. Thank you very Thank you much. Our you keynote pleasure. speaker again. And then I think it's now time for a short 10 minute break before we start into the first technical session of the conference. And I hope Ivona will be around in Slack in case you have more questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Congestion takes time, that goes. Okay, do. Let's get started. Wow, what a great uh, keynote speaker from Ivona, uh, Ivona and Brandy. I love her take on sustainability and edge computing. Thanks again for putting that together for us. Hi, I'm Klaus, Klaus Lang. I am the session chair for the service on cloud computing uh, um, part of the conference. As always, the ICPE organization has prepared a great program for you. More importantly, it has created the program with you. Um, and after each slide uh, presentation, we will have a short uh, rescheduled time for a Q&A session uh, with the authors so that you um, yeah, for, have follow-up question, and then I will monitor the um, uh, Slack channel as well, in order to ensure that we have all the questions there. At this point, I would like to introduce you to Richard and his uh, Richard Lee and his um, research team, in order to present their take on automatic explanations on 
performance anomalies in microservices. Uh, Richard, please go ahead. Yep. Um, can you see my screen now? Yes, we will do. Yeah, cool. Hi guys, um, I'm Richard Lee. I'm a research scientist in Meta. Uh, today I'm presenting long tail towards automatic performance anomaly explanation in microservices. This work is joint work with uh, University of Utah, Peralta Network, and Nokia Bell Lab. Cloud computing today is migrating to monolith uh, from my monolithic application to micro microservices to achieve better scalability, fast development, and fast deployment. But this benefit comes with the cost. Um, in, in the microservices, when there's anything goes wrong, uh, especially performance issue, it is very difficult to find the root cause and to analyze it and fix it. Let's look at a very simple example. Here's a CDF I draw uh, for the RPC latency. Uh, it is serviced by five services. Um, and from this very simple um, CDF, we can ask, actually ask many questions. First of all, is this tail latency a normal tail latency or it is a, a normal one? We don't know because we don't even have the baseline to compare with. And yet, let's, see, let's assume it is just a, a normal tail latency. We can ask even more questions. What, um, which service is contributing the most to the tail? Uh, is it only one service contributing as the culprit or all the services are to blame? It can also happen when the anomalies are happen scattered around across all the services. Uh, we take this as a um, motivating scenario that uh, in the microservices world, this kind of scenario is, is very difficult to explain that uh, scattered microburst of resource saturation can be very difficult to, to pinpoint. Services are can be similarly abnormal and coarse grain performance and monitoring tool cannot help. And it, those um, anomalies can be sparsely spread out across the whole cluster and application layer tracing is limited to understand it and container orchestration auto scaler may be too coarse grain and it cannot help with this fine grain situation either. So the goal of this paper is to explain this kind of particular anomaly scenario automatically. If we can explain this uh, scenario, many other uh, scenarios can be explained. Um, the solution to this uh, problem here is actually very simple. What if we can compare the slow and the fast? If we can compare the slow and the fast, we can know what is going on with the slow. But to answer this question is actually pretty challenging. There are two main challenges. First of all, existing tracing tools are limited that uh, the, the data they provided without extra processing cannot be used. Secondly, uh, there's no clear way to effectively compare the traces uh, to extract knowledge for troubleshooting. Before we come to more detail about how we do that, let's look at this uh, overall architecture. So we have uh, three virtual machines here. Each virtual machine has multiple containers on it. And there's an A, B, and C container talking to each other as a typical um, a microservice uh, application. Uh, in, in, in this case, we have application layer tracing that uh, each container, we have an application layer tracing agent uh, sending application, uh, 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 application layer tracing client, sending data of application layer traces to application layer agent, and then going to the uh, database. With that, oops. Um, and we also have the system call, uh, system stack traces uh, keep collecting going on, and we send all this data into an analysis node. Um, with these two layer of data, we do a four steps um, of processing. We stitch application layer tracing with stack traces, and then we aggregate the execution context, and then we generate factors, and then we feed into the uh, machine learning algorithm to perform feature detection. Let's come to more detail. In this picture, you can see as time goes by, we have fast span, which is a quick response, we have slow span, which is the red one, which is longer. Um, these spans, we call it application layer tracing. Each span, it has a name, has a start and end time associating with it. With that, we also have the system stack traces. A system stack traces is uh, 
essentially a series of uh, slicings. Uh, it is uh, it is a series of snapshot. Each snapshot is a uh, essentially a call chain function A calling function B calling function C from cross access. So when we are doing we, when we are doing this application layer uh, uh, stitching, we are stitching the application layer tracing with the system call traces as such that we take the uh, start and end time and associating this uh, span with the system call stack traces. Um, not no system calls, it is system stack traces. And then uh, from, from this, this picture, for example, we can see the abnormal span may saturate it with a normal processes. Um, and for a short span, which is a faster one, may have a bigger fraction of the uh, normal or uh, serving uh, processes. And sometimes we can see some, some span is too short that uh, it does not even contain the, the user processes. Because when we are collecting the system stack traces, it is doing in a sample way. We sample it in a, uh, 1,000 times a second. So it has chances that we don't collect the, the user processes. But it also tells us that a single, uh, single instance of span does not reflect the status of the system. We need aggregated view of multiple spans to make a statistically stable view of the execution state. How, this is the way we do the aggregation. So when we are doing the aggregate, aggregation, we are actually put together, randomly selecting uh, fast spans, put them together as a 10 seconds of duration, and then randomly se select spans, put together a, a slow duration. With these things, we can construct two copy of uh, frame graph, which is aggregation of system stack traces. And then with this, with this uh, uh, frame graph compar comparison, you, you can actually see that um, on the left, it only takes less than 1% of the uh, normal process. And on the right, the slow one takes more than 13%, which is intuitively easy to tell which one uh, the reason of the uh, anomaly. But this is, again, this is one single data point. We want to collect a statistically stable view of this data set. So we generate multiple, many vectors of them, and we draw a table. For this table, each, vector, each row is a vector, each column is a feature. The feature is essentially the function name or the function call chain. And the uh, label is the duration of the request. We feed this data to the uh, machine learning algorithm. Here we use Elastic uh, um, for doing feature selection. With the with elastic net, we we can uh, get the coefficient of each feature to the result or the label, and it can give. We, we sort this coefficient value. Uh, uh, we sort the feature by the coefficient value, and we get the picture like this. From the this picture, we actually can see that the normal case is very flat. In mathematical language, it is a very low uh, standard deviation. And we use that, we use the 10, uh, value of 10 to uh, consider the normal uh, as a normal. We, we run many experiments, we saw the um, false negative and false positive result later on. Um, we use the 99 percentile to decide whether it is the normal case or a normal case. From this picture, the takeaway here is that the stress NG here uh, is, uh, has a very, very high association with the slowdown. To evaluate, uh, to evaluate this idea, we asked multiple questions. Here we show the, the uh, some quick exam, uh, quick quick result uh, for the time limitation. We can can long tail explain of normal latency uh, is long tail service agnostic, and uh, can we uh, explain multiple performance interference factors coexisted? Uh, we our evaluation environment consists of a, a sixth physical machine. We use OpenStack, Kubernetes, and a real world uh, software uh, microservice as the workload. Uh, first of all, for this experiment, we have different intensity of anomaly uh, injected. The first line is the normal cases, which is no um, uh, anomaly injected. And from the standard deviation column, we can see that the, the normal cases has a very, very low standard deviation uh, much lower than others. And the second, col uh, second, second column is the description of the intensity. For example, this is why it's like random spike every one to five minutes with a duration of three to five seconds. So 
with this kind of eight kinds of uh, configuration, we can draw a, a, a plot like this. And as you can see here, this plot, um, all the, the anomaly are highlighted as the outliers. And it, we successfully uh, detect all the normal cases and also explain the most uh, uh, significant factor for the slowdown. And we also visualize the result uh, when and where this anomaly happened. And we also uh, do experiment to show that uh, long tail is ag service agnostic. Here you can see uh, we run six um, uh, applications. Three of them are in Java, three are in Go. And we uh, run them same load for 10 times and uh, analyze the false positive and false negative. Uh, here there's one uh, outlier data point, which is the false negative. Uh, for the payment, which is 60%. And we look into the uh, code of the implementation of SubShop. It actually, it is the echo server where you send it and you will reply immediately, which is the, the span is too short for us to do the uh, 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 right um, analysis. But, but the takeaway is the long tails works for different type of microservice developed in different language without any domain specific knowledge. And here uh, we also have the different performance interference uh, factors, we inject multiple type of performance interference, and then we can see that the long tail can, can highlight this as a normally, and with different level of intensity, you can show the different, um, it is in line with our experiment design. To summarize, it's feasible to automatically explain performance anomaly in the cloud by stitching application layer and system level chasing in an application agnostic and in immediately deployable fashion. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Wow, what an awesome presentation. Hey, before we go to this um, q and a, a question about the application layer training, uh, tracing. How practical actually, how you do that? I was, I'm not familiar with that technique. Oh, okay. Application layer tracing nowadays in microservice is very uh, uh, popular. Is essentially, what it does is that when, when you run a container, uh, a, a function is start and end, you, you always re, uh, record this information and it will send this information to the to a application layer tracing agent and then you will send to a database and there's uh, this, um, for example, open tracing, all these kind of uh, tools for you, uh, for all the microservice to keep track of what is happening and uh, to keep track of the start and end time of the request. So you can draw the plot um, and this is like uh, you, almost every microservice application nowadays uh, go with it. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Helps me a lot. Uh, I'm not, I will check into that technique. Um, is there any questions out there? I think, David, you had one. Do you want to speak up, please? Yeah, sure. Um, I uh, uh, Thanks for the talk. I enjoyed it. Um, so you're able to show with a synthetic workload that you're, I mean, a, a synthetic stress that you could find the stress and diagnose it. Did you have, uh, did you try to run it just in production and see if you could find real issues in, in a system or have thoughts on uh, maybe how you would go about doing that? It, um, we, we only try with uh, the synthetic one. It's actually pretty bit difficult to get the real, real system. Uh, to play with real system on that. At that time, I was a PhD student. This is why I earlier I was asking uh, Ivana to, to see how, how they collect the data because actually for this research, data collection part is very difficult. <laughs> yeah. That's fair. Excellent. Excellent. I think we have time for one more question. Um, uh, Richard, from a, from the practical uh, perspective, um, since I'm from the from the industry, um, how you see that can be implemented in a real world environment? How we can utilize it? Sorry, sorry, what, sorry. What's that? In the for a real world environment uh, in the industry, how we could utilize this detection now? I th I think uh, to utilize this, you just need to install the agent on the on the host, and because currently in the industry has already have this. Uh, uh, has this like application layer tracing information going on and like a company like Netflix, they have this host uh, host site monitoring or perf 
or this system that traces collection, as long as you have these information to collect it together, we can do the stitching and do the processing. This is why in our paper, we are claiming it is immediately deployable fashion. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much, Richard and team. Um, absolutely fantastic presentation. I appreciate that very much. And now we will go to Mohammed. Uh, hello. Talking, talking about service mesh traffic. Uh, management policies for microservices. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Okay. Hello. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Then uh, I'm Mohamed Reza, uh, uh, a PhD student here at UMI University in Sweden. Uh, let's skip ahead. Uh, before we deep dive into the empirical study, let's take a look at some concepts. The first one is microservice. Uh, as you know, microservice is an architecture and a style that structures an application as a collection of distributed services with multiple instances that function as cohesive and independent processes interacting via messages. These services are uh, highly maintainable and testable. They are loosely coupled and uh, they are independently deployable. And most of the time they, uh, they are owned by, uh, by a small team. But uh, microservice could add some challenges because its performance depends on, uh, on the implemented functionality and the incoming workload, and increasing load may cause violation of a service level objective. Therefore, the inter-service uh, communication and traffic management mechanisms uh, used in such dynamic environments are so complex. Also, uh, a failure in deeper uh, layers of a service chain could be propagated to all other layers. Service measures uh, were introduced to handle this complexity and prevent the propagation of the failures. They can also facilitate management, observability, and communication between microservices. But uh, what is a service mesh in essence? Uh, a service mesh is an infrastructure layer built directly into the microservices as a set of configurable proxies. This allows the network to be completely abstracted, providing a single point of network interaction for each service. A service mesh uh, provides a range of traffic management policies such as second working and reply mechanism, uh, which are claimed to make application more robust and resilient uh, towards failures of a dependent service or the network. Uh, in a previous study, we learned that second working rejects incoming requests to protect latency at the expense of availability, enabling fast reactions to overload and load spikes and failures. And uh, on the other hand, reply mechanism is the procedure of replying the failed request. So how did we start? Uh, we observed that this, uh, despite the considerable interest in both circuit breaking and reply mechanism and the potential benefits for microservice robustness and perfor performance, there's a lack of systematic studies how, uh, on how effective these policies and their control parameters actually are. To clarify the impact of traffic management policies based on circuit breakers and reply mechanisms, as well as the effects of varying the parameter setting of uh, these tools, we define three research questions, uh, as you can see here, uh, and try to answer them all. Uh, now let's talk about our approach. To collect data for our study, we developed a configuration, uh, with a configuration manager that repeatedly configures traffic management policies for a selected and deployed application in Istio as a service mesh. Then we ran the traffic generator to generate uh, an open loop workload and during the execution of the traffic generator, the response times and uh, responses of all services were monitored. Uh, then uh, we manually identified three key traffic management parameters in Istio. The first one is HTTP max request, uh, which is the size of the queue in the circuit breaker configuration. And also there are two parameters for the time mechanism. The first one is attempt which specifies the maximum number of times the, the sidecar proxy attempts to connect to a service if the initial call fails. And the second is per tour timeout, which specifies the interval between retries when attempting to connect to a service. Uh, generally, this study contains six different dimensions. Uh, there's three different scenarios for circuit breaker configuration, retry attempts, retry intervals, incoming traffic, and load, load spikes and also four scenarios for enforcement point of circuit breaker or retry mechanism. We studied all possible combination of these, uh, these six dimensions. 
Uh, during this study, we performed thousands of experiments, but we discussed three, uh, 320 of them. Each experiment took five minutes to complete. And more than uh, during these experiments, more than 110 million requests were generated for the discussing experiments, and they took more than 130 hours. Uh, so uh, to analyze uh, the results uh, of each configuration of traffic management in service mesh, we plot uh, 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 the frequency of each response type uh, over time and cumulative distribution functions of the response times of all requests and carry, uh, and carry throughput at the same time and compare them all together. Uh, as mentioned before, uh, we performed various types of experiments to understand how these policies are working together. Uh, for circuit breaker policies, we explored uh, the impact of varying the circuit breaker enforcement points, different incoming traffic volume, and different thresholds. And for reply mechanism, we first studied uh, how the combination of uh, reply mechanism works uh, with circuit breaker. And then we explored the impact of various reply attempts and reply intervals. And to reveal the most common use case of uh, reply mechanism, we also explored various workload spikes and different retry intervals together. And finally, we have studied different enforcement points of both circuit breaker and retry mechanisms to see how they can improve their performance together. But uh, for more detailed experiments, we just take a look at our paper and the pre recorded presentation to see the details. Uh, but now uh, let's discuss the results. Uh, first research question asks, uh, how should circuit breakers be configured? Our experiments showed that a well-configured well -configured circuit breaker can maintain a favorable response time while maximizing uh, application throughput. Circuit breakers enable fast uh, failures and prevent clients from repeatedly trying to connect to an overloaded or failing service. Uh, circuit breakers are, can also enhance the user experience. To summarize, we found that configuring circuit breakers to act, uh, to act on lower application layers improves the user experience. Finally, we conclude that uh, circuit breakers are useful in the case of transient failure or overload. Uh, second research question asks, uh, how should the try mechanism be configured? Based on our experiments, if a sensitive circuit breaker is used, the simultaneous use of a retry mechanism may lead to a retry store, which is expected. Uh, but if the circuit breaker is not properly configured, a retry mechanism may surprisingly increase throughput during load spikes. We also learned that a high number of retry attempts is unhelpful and may diminish the user experience by increasing the response time. Also, the same is true for a high retry interval. While an overly short uh, retry interval may worsen overloads or failures, we conclude that retry mechanisms are useful only for managing transient failures or uh, overload situations. Third research question uh, asks, how do workload characteristics impact the answers to the first two research questions? Uh, based on the results of our experiments, uh, overload is inevitable uh, if the incoming traffic volume exceeds the capacity of the resources. During a transient overload, a circuit breaker can enable fast failure, which improves the user experience. And uh, we also conclude that load spikes can be controlled by using proper circuit breaker configuration in conjunction with a small number of permitted retry attempts with a retry interval that is neither too low nor too high. And we believe that uh, the overload situation is not transient. Uh, uh, then the circuit breaker, uh, if the overload situation is not transient, then the circuit breaker pattern and retry mechanism uh, are not really good choices for managing uh, and maintaining an acceptable uh, user experience. So uh, finally, this paper studies service mesh traffic management policies for microservices to provide an initial guidance on the practical use of these policies and to show how they can increase application performance and resiliency. And as microservice performance uh, depends on many factors, uh, we believe that configuring traffic management policies can be really challenging. Also, the service mesh uh, landscape is uh, rapidly evolving, and some features available in proxy sidecar cannot uh, be controlled through the service mesh control plane. Uh, but the use of service mesh enables outstanding observability without imposing any particular uh, implementation cost during the development process, which suggests that it may be beneficial to develop methods for autonomous control of the service mesh. So we are going to look in 
to that in my future research. And thank you. Mohamed, thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting talk. Um, now we would like to open it for Q&A. Um, before people maybe start with their questions, um, we're looking right now on um, benchmarking of microservices and trying to create a benchmark around it. Um, from, a, from a mesh traffic management um, policies, is there any advice you would give us? What was the research, what you found? What would be important for a performance metric there? Uh, from the service mesh side, you mean? Yes. Uh, for the service mesh side, uh, I would say that uh, they are really useful, easy to use, but at this point, they are somehow really complex to use for industry. And uh, they are somehow ne uh, new in the community, but they are really interesting. Okay, excellent. Is there any questions from the audience? Uh, David. All right, I guess I'm gonna make it worth it getting up early. Um, <laughs> any thoughts on um, just in general when the size of your requests uh, vary, possibly largely? So I assume all your requests can be in the same at the front end are about the same amount of work to do stuff. Um, you know, how you pick the level of the circuit breaker or how you make the system work when something might be like 10 times larger amount of work than something else. Yes. Uh, we, uh, as the first step, we, did, uh, we define the capacity of the uh, system and uh, try to see uh, uh, how many requests can system res uh, respond to uh, within uh, less than uh, 100 milliseconds uh, of latency. And uh, then we uh, measure that one. And then uh, that was uh, our capacity. And after that, we decided to, uh, which, uh, uh, we changed the circuit breaker to see how, uh, if we increase the traffic volume, how circuit breaker really uh, control the traffic and also uh, response point. Excellent. Does that answer your question, David? Otherwise, we will go to Murray. <clears throat> Mohammed, thank you for your talk. I um, I was wondering, you got some insights out of looking at all the experiments. And um, I was wondering if you looked at any analytic models to see if those insights matched with what you might expect from certain patterns of, of parameters in uh, in analytic models, which can which which can produce the same results depending on frequency of uh, uh, of failures or anomalies and, and so on. Did you did you do any of that? Uh, no, uh, not really. We didn't do that uh, because in the service based side, I, I really couldn't really find any relevant topic. Uh, but uh, I, I'm really eager to find anything related. Uh, but no, we didn't do that. Okay, no, no I, I don't have references at my fingertips, but it's the kind of thing that, that can be looked at with, I mean, I'm not saying the models would fit well, but they might show similar patterns or something. Mm. Yeah, uh, no, we didn't find anything, but uh, I was reading in some, uh, Industrial conferences uh, keynotes that there's the common sense, uh, common sense uh, rules for configuring circuit breaker patterns, but it's not really well studied before. So that's why we started to this topic. Excellent. Um, Andrew, do you have a question? Uh, Andre, you had a question? Oh, uh, then I missed one after. Okay. Is there any other questions for right now? Otherwise, we can have the conversation further in the Slack. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you again, Mohamed and team um, for your insightful paper and hopefully, and, and good luck for, for your future endeavor there. I do really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And next, we have Selam uh, on the line. And that is one of, one of the reasons I, I really love ICPE because Selam and I, we worked back in the days together on some, some stuff. And then we didn't see us on end today. Um, we, we ran into each other again. Although it's just, um, thanks for, for having you uh, being here again and uh, uh, preparing an awesome talk on HPC workloads on the public cloud. 
Ilam, please go ahead. Yeah, so just a correction. Bob is going to give the talk. Bob is on the call. <laughs> Thank you. Bob? Yep. <clears throat> Um, okay, this is Bob Walkup, and I'll be uh, speaking about uh, best practices for HPC workloads on public cloud platforms. Um, my colleagues and I are from IBM's research division, so the examples will be from IBM Cloud, but um, most of the considerations apply across um, all cloud providers. And uh, I'm going to try to uh, skip through this material in eight minutes or so, and we'll see how well that works. Um, when you go to a cloud provider, um, all cloud providers have extensive catalogs with many different types of virtual machines. So virtual machines are typically based on x86 servers, and there are two virtual CPUs per core. So a virtual CPU in cloud maps to a hyperthread, and you'll find virtual machines with as few as two virtual CPUs or just one core and virtual machines with up to 128 virtual CPUs are 64 cores and up to a terabyte of memory. When you get to these large virtual machines, 64 cores up to a terabyte of memory, there's a lot of HPC capability in one virtual machine. So my first recommendation is, if your job can fit in a single virtual machine, choose that option. That's going to give you really good communication performance um, and that can make a big difference for your workload. The communication performance is shown in this chart. Uh, the bottom curve is the ex message exchange time using shared memory, uh, sub microsecond latency, uh, compared to using Ethernet, uh, TCP protocol Ethernet with BERT IO for network virtualization, where message latencies are in the 30 to 40 microsecond range. So, nearly a factor of 100 lower latency. So, if you have communication, intensive workload that can fit on a large shared memory virtual machine, uh, it's uh, highly advantageous to go that route. Um, if you have to scale out with um, TCP and Ethernet, and that's the most commonly available and most cost-effective networking solution on cloud, you need to pay attention to network bandwidth limitations. And this is a table from IBM Cloud showing the overall network bandwidth in the, listed in the catalog for virtual machines with 16 virtual CPUs, 32 virtual CPUs, and 48 virtual CPUs. The aggregate bandwidth listed in the catalog increases as you increase the virtual CPU count, but the important thing to realize is that if you just have one configured virtual network interface, one Ethernet interface, that single interface is capped at 25 gigabits per second. And because of that, you'll have much better bandwidth per core using these smaller building blocks. So that's that's the consideration that leads you to choose these smaller building blocks uh, when you scale out to large core counts. Now you don't wanna go much smaller than 16 virtual CPUs because then the network bandwidth for your single virtual NIC will be throttled so the maximum bandwidth that you can achieve per process is also capped. So this is really like an optimum choice. Um, you can configure multiple ethernet interfaces. And if you do that, um, I'm recommending that you use MPI built on top of UCX because uh, with UCX, you can control um, which processes use which interface through an environment variable UCX net devices. Uh, <clears throat> I'll show an example of that in this chart. Um, this is a network bandwidth versus message size, a single network interface and using two interfaces. And the blue chart, the blue curve is using UCX um, with UCX net devices set so that half of the ranks on a virtual machine use one interface, the other half use the other interface. Um, that way you get full benefit from two interfaces without having to stripe messages across the interfaces. The striping is shown in the brown curve. And when you're using TCP protocol on clouds, I'm gonna recommend uh, the following set of TCP tuning options. Uh, these options apply uh, really across the board to any cloud provider. Anytime you're using TCP protocol, you shouldn't assume that the uh, operating system is going to provide you with the best TCP tuning options. These things will tend to improve your messaging performance. 
uh, on Ethernet systems in cloud. Um, what to do about hyperthreading? Um, I'm going to spend very little time on this. Um, on IBM Cloud, um, there's um, the network virtualization is done by Vertio Net. And all the communication when you're scaling out is going to be TCP protocol over Ethernet. And this combination of um, software results in a lot of contention for CPU utilization by kernel threads. And it's the CPU, it's the contention for CPU resources that um, drives the consideration that you should really just bind one processor or thread per core, leave half the virtual CPUs free because kernel threads need those slots for execution. And our experience has been that if you have a very communication intensive job on cloud and you try to use all the hyper threads for computation, that can slow your job down by 10x or more. So it's, you're much better off binding one processor thread per core. Um, I'll just show a couple of case studies. The first one is OpenFoam, computational fluid dynamics, where I'm showing the time to solution using two different types of cloud systems. This, this one uh, in the column with the CX2128 by 256, this is a single virtual, a large virtual uh, shared memory virtual machine. So there's no ethernet communication. Same core count as shown on the right, 128 virtual CPUs, but there are four virtual machines that are ethernet connected. And you can see that the time to solution can be much um, lower with the shared memory systems, uh, not a big surprise. Uh, cost on cloud basically scales with the number of virtual CPUs. So this solution is uh, both more time efficient and more cost efficient. Um, when you scale out with uh, TCP protocol, uh, you can achieve really good scaling on cloud systems, even with ethernet uh, and a single interface, as long as you choose a suitable virtual machine. Um, this curve shows the scaling for WARF, um, a weather forecasting code. Uh, this is a high resolution model uh, scaling out uh, beyond a thousand cores. And I'm comparing performance on IBM cloud with the Summit supercomputing system at Oak Ridge National Labs. Now Summit has a very strong communication uh, network, two EDR adapters per node. And on cloud, we're using a single network interface, TCP protocol, with these instances with 16 virtual CPUs. This gives us good bandwidth per core, and there's more than enough network performance to achieve good scaling and overall performance. The y-axis is simulation speed. A simulation speed of 50 means you can do 50 forecast hours in one wall clock hour, and that's good enough to get you into uh, the range that's desirable for performance range that's desirable for production weather forecasting. Um, another example of scaling on cloud, uh, the blue curve on top is IBM Cloud, the same instance type, 16 virtual CPUs. Um, this is a benchmark for Boltzmann Transport. It's um, one of the Department of Energy benchmarks used to quantify uh, commodity technology systems. And it's actually a very communication intensive benchmark because um, there's a very small local domain so most of the grid cells are on the boundary. Um, this benchmark is very network bandwidth intensive, but the message sizes are about 100 kilobytes. So it's not very sensitive to network latency. And that makes it a good candidate for scaling on cloud systems with TCP. And uh, I'm going to basically stop here with a short summary and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. Uh, on the HPC side, uh, is there any questions for Bob or Silam at this point? Silam uh, or Rob, um, from, again, from a benchmark perspective, is there any insights we, you get out of this that we need to consider when in our benchmark development? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think, Bob, we should take a little bit of time to think about it. Um, and at least we didn't find, I think, any standard good way to benchmark HPC on cloud. Right? Um, so I have some comments about that. I mean, I've uh, 
really de I've developed some very sensitive tests of scalability using an artificial workload. Um, I call it OS noise, but basically uh, you have each process do exactly the same amount of compute work and then communicate and you can vary the computational time and the communication load. And that turns out to provide an extremely sensitive test of scaling. And uh, I think that's something that should be uh, made use of much more broadly in the HPC arena. Okay, maybe we can uh, talk about that offline a little bit because I'm interested in your findings and hopefully we might can do something uh, from the uh, benchmark development side there. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, thanks again for preparing all the presentation for us today. Uh, I really enjoyed that. The next presentation is by Lixiam Yu. Um, are you there? Can you start sharing at this point? Yeah, sure. Um, we me cannot one... see this slide. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to show it. Uh, screen. Can I see you now? Yeah, yes, okay. we've seen your browser. Okay. Um, okay, uh, I'm Li Xiangluo. Uh, you can call me Eric. Uh, I'm going to give you a, give a talk about uh, localized NVMe storage virtualization for public cloud virtual machines. So I need to go quick. Uh, next slide. Yeah. So uh, just, an, just an overview. Um, yeah, going through these uh, topics, motivation, uh, and then I'll talk about options and then followed by performance assessment of different options. Um, so let's go start right away. So motivations. So why, why do we need a localized uh, uh, MBM? Uh, basically everyone is doing it. And uh, we, um, IBM need to, need to adopt this as well. Uh, there are many applications that um, can utilize this, hyper throughput databases, GPU-based training, Especially uh, nowadays, uh, everyone is doing these uh, huge uh, foundation models. Uh, all the input data set have to be uh, cached localized, otherwise uh, the, the performance just crash. And also uh, more traditional high performance computing applications, uh, just like the ones that Bob just talked about. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, the different cloud uh, per, uh, vendors uh, provider has different support levels uh, on bare metal. Uh, IBM has been providing this and AWS as well. Um, more recently on virtual machine side, uh, IBM uh, also include uh, this support. So this is, this study is actually part of the uh, um, effort to, to uh, enable the uh, localized MVM on the virtual machine uh, cloud for uh, on the IBM cloud. And uh, AWS, Microsoft, and Google all have uh, support for localized NVMe on virtual machine cloud. <laughs> so there are three options we uh, are considered, uh, serious to consider. Uh, one is the first is the device pass-through. The second is name, uh, a vert IO block uh, backed by the uh, NVMe namespaces. The third is uh, SPDKV host target. Uh, there are other options we didn't uh, consider, for example, per virtualization. Uh, currently, it, uh, there's a risk of uh, security there and also a mediated device pass-through, uh, which is similar to SPDKV host, but uh, technology is not mature enough. Um, so, so we'll focus on the first three options. <clears throat> Um, the first one is device pass-through. Basically, uh, in an NVMe, just say a PCI device, you can uh, pass through to the um, to the virtual machine, and uh, virtual machine has full control over device. Uh, the good thing is that it has near bare metal performance, um, best peak throughput, lowest latency, but also comes with a lot of limitations. Uh, cannot be shared. Uh, live migration is ne next to impossible. Uh, uh, hardware specifications of the MVM is fully exposed to the end user, uh, which the, the providers don't, probably don't want to do. 
um, and there's no uh, quality of service because one virtual machine has the, the full device. And you, can, you don't know the host, you don't know what's going on with the device after it's passed through. Uh, the second option is the, uh, the virtual block backed by namespace, uh, NVMe namespace. So namespace, NVMe namespace is a inherent uh, uh, feature of the, the NVMe uh, specification. So um, every NVMe device have to provide some kind of uh, support, hardware support for the namespaces. So, <clears throat> and the virtual block is the very traditional way of providing uh, uh, virtual block devices to the, to the virtual machines. But instead of a, a image file, uh, we use a, a an NVMe namespace as, a, as the backing storage. This is very uh, similar to using a, a spinning disk partition as a, as a backing uh, storage. But instead of that, we use a NVMe namespace. Uh, there are some uh, nice things about this, this combination, but um, um, the nice thing is, is uh, the, the virtual uh, virtualization layer provides uh, quality of service and caching, extra caching. And uh, it, it can be shared multiple by multiple VMs because you can create many uh, namespace, namespaces on the same NVMe device. And um, we can use the hardware encryption provided by the namespace as well. Uh, limitation is uh, also apparent. Uh, it has lower throughput, higher latency because the, all the emulations going on uh, the overhead is quite significant. The third option we consider is the SBDK vhost. Uh, this is a combination of uh, uh, virial and the uh, SBDK. So <clears throat> it can be uh, considered as a, a uh, compromise between the first two. Um, it uh, QMU provides a thin IO virtualization um, and uh, the IO is carried about by dedicated SPDK user space processes, polling the NVM devices. Uh, so all these are happening on the on the host side. Uh, the guest sees a virtual um, uh, virtual interfaces provided by the QE, uh, QE. So there are many benefits, um, low overhead, uh, high throughput, um, possible live migration. The performance is nearly as good as uh, uh, device path to us, we will see. Um, it can also support encryption and, and erasing using namespaces. Uh, limitation is that the technology is not as mature. Um, overhead by uh, over IO layer is still uh, significant. So this is a table comparing all the three options uh, on different aspects. <clears throat> I won't go through everything here, but uh, uh, it's a it's good uh, comparison. Um, so let's move on to the performance study. So uh, this is uh, um, the methodology we adopted. Um, we use the workflow emulator FIO. So everyone knows um, it, it provides a very good uh, uh, high level view of the trends. And uh, we also use real workloads. Uh, first one is Alex Net training um, with PyTorch. The second one is uh, the RocksDB benchmark, uh, it's with, which comes with the RocksDB software package. And uh, it's not a real workload, it's, uh, but it's, uh, we'll say it's, uh, uh, it's closer to, to a real workload here. And uh, we, uh, we collect system level statistics, uh, the usual metrics, uh, um, and uh, for analysis. So we use a Supermicro um, uh, server and, uh, and a Samsung 1725 for tests. These are the numbers. All right, let's move on to the uh, performance study. So um, for device path through, uh, you can take a look at the figures on the right, uh, comparing device path through and bare metal performance. So you can see performance is very close. Overhead minimal, scalability excellent, 
Um, there's some small penalty for longer queues. Um, and uh, whole CPU, uh, the, and the CPU load is, uh, is basically is minimal extra CPU load, which is expected. Uh, also, we are focusing on a 4K random read for all the tests uh, because that's the most stressful uh, test and, uh, for, for the NVMe. Um, one thing we found is uh, use deeper queue is, is uh, beneficial which is um, quite obvious actually, uh, because deeper queues can offer better concurrency without much trade-off. Uh, there's, no, there's no significant higher CPU load. Um, so on, one question we, we consider is uh, if we can improve upon the device path. Actually, we found a way. Actually, uh, what we did is uh, running SPDK inside VM on top of device path. And we found that the performance is even better than bare metal sometimes. Um, the limitation is that um, the application must support SPDK directly and, uh, and, uh, and there's some code, source code changes. So it, it is not trivial, but at least we know that uh, there's some way to uh, improve upon device path. So, so this is the, the, another um, <clears throat> option we consider seriously. Um, so this is actually what we implemented uh, on, on IBM Cloud. Um, so we use a Vert IO block providing a virtual block devices and uh, it's backed by an NVMe, NVMe namespaces. So performance wise, um this uh we found that backing using a namespace or a, a image file are quite similar um and and we found that uh this approach uh, backed by namespaces provide reasonable performance and sometimes uh, when especially when the deep uh, the queue is shallow or or even uh, synchronous IO and the performance is uh, uh, slightly better than device path because mostly because of the caching. Uh, the, the disadvantage of, of this approach is that there are some extra uh, CPU uh, load uh, because of this emulation and, and uh, all the software uh, uh, stacks. involved. Um, so <clears throat> the third option we consider is the SPK, SPDK vhost. Um, there are some several options for uh, how to provide the virtual interfaces. Uh, we found that uh, at, at least at the, at the time of the writing, the vhost user's guess is still the best to provide overall performance. Um, <clears throat> so what does the performance look like comparing it with uh, device path. We can see that uh, uh, it actually has very rather close, I would say, uh, performance as device path. And the scaling is very good. Uh, latency is low. Um, there's some sacrifices, of course, uh, because it says SPK, the CPU have to be pulled doing the, all the polling. So there's some extra CPU low there. Um, however, we didn't adopt it this, uh, and, and none of the other public cloud providers uh, did this because uh, there's no clear advantage for shorter queues, and it requires a dedicated huge page memory for DMA. So uh, there's some uh, complication. We use RocksDB for, uh, for performance study as well. Uh, we'll skip through these. Uh, uh, we'll, Let's spend one more minute on security considerations. Um, data privacy and security are a very important factor for, for enterprise tenants on public clouds. Um, so all the, the, the data has to be securely uh, wiped. Uh, one thing we can do with the uh, NVMe as a backing storage is that we can simply drop the encryption, encryption key and the, and the data is, uh, becomes invalid instantly. So <clears throat> that's the conclusion. 
uh, I'm, I'm not going to read through all these, but uh, there's some ongoing uh, tasks and future tasks. Uh, Liam, um, yep. awesome. Thank you very much. Very good insight. I had a question about, uh, you said some of the studies you saw that uh, you saw better performance, even better performance in uh, on the cloud environment than on bare metal. That sounds to be pretty, um, um, yeah, a little bit different than what I would expect. And do you have an insight why that is? No, that's, a, that's, a, that's not surprising actually if you use SPDK, uh, either if you use SPDK on the bare metal, you can you can sometimes get better performance than than without SPDK, right? So the the slide we just show running SPDK inside the VM uh, and then on top of device path through is just that SPDK doing its job. So okay, there's no magic there. It's the difference between polling versus interrupt driven IO. Exactly. SPDK okay. is doing polling. <laughs> are there are there other questions in the audience at this point? Uh, let me see. There was one from Eric, I believe. Uh, so yeah, uh, you all have the same question. One uh, one last thing is about uh, you said what is the most uh, stressful um, uh, access patterns you had with MA, uh, and VME drives, and why is that? Uh, the 4K read. 4K read. Uh, random reads. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. Because of the randomness of the small ones. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Thank you. Any other questions? I see none. Hopefully, otherwise, speak up. Uh, otherwise, I would like to um, thank everybody for the first session of the ICP 2022. Um, um, I um, thanks again for the authors and um, to uh, prepare these interesting talks. Thank you very much. And we will go, now go into the break. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, Klaus. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody. We move into a break and we join again at 4.15 European time. And Heng Lee is going to be the session chair of the next session. So maybe you can start organizing this. Sounds good. Thank you. Good Thanks to see everybody. you, Sam. Bye. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. I want to. Uh, so I'm a chair of the next session. I want to confirm that uh, all the speakers are here. Uh, if you are a speaker of the next session, can you please uh, uh, tell me that you are here?
Hello, is a, is a speaker uh, uh, Rizwan Ashraf here? So you are the speaker of the first paper in the next session. I'm I'm checking if we could play the recording. If he's not here, I saw him earlier. Okay. Yeah, we. this presentation. Hello again. Uh, if you are a speaker of the any paper of the next session, on GPU and the heterogeneous uh, platform, please, uh, please uh, let me know that you are here. So we, we, we understand, do we need to play the video or just uh, go live for your presentation? So I see Rico. Hello. Yes, Rizwan. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, hi, Rizwan. Hi. So, so, so you are speaker of the first uh, paper. So we will start, uh, I think, uh, right now. Okay. Uh... So. So let's, I think it's time to start this, this session, right? Yeah, I'm going to share my slides. Okay, so yeah, yeah. So I will, I will just briefly like introduce maybe just one minute. Okay, um, hello everyone. Uh, so welcome to the second session, GPUs and the heterogeneous uh, platforms. So in this session, we have four interesting papers, three, four, research papers and one short paper. And uh, so for full paper, 10 minutes presentation plus five minute uh, QA. And for short paper, in the short paper, five minute presentation plus five minute QA, okay. And uh, so when time is up, I will ask you to conclude your paper. And also um, for the audience, you can ask your questions via the Slack channel. We have a Slack channel uh, for the session two, okay. And uh, you, you may also ask your question at the end of this, this uh, talk uh, by voice. And uh, I, encourage, I encourage everyone to open your camera if you can, especially when you are asking questions, okay? And also, uh, let's welcome the first speaker of our session, uh, Rizwan, please go ahead.
Rizwan, you can share your screen and start this uh, presentation. Hello, hello Rizwan, can you, uh, did you hear us? Can you hear me? Looks a little bit frozen. Uh, okay, uh, hi Rizwan, you. can you start to uh, start your presentation, please? Yeah, uh, sorry, I'm having trouble sharing my slides. So can I, uh, I guess, email them to you? Um, or I, I can I can I can play your slides. Uh, so your slides is the one the version that you post on Slack, right? Uh, did did I post on Slack? Oh, I, no, no, I'm not sure. So we can also play your video if you like. But the video is twenty minutes long. <laughs> uh, can I? Let me. I guess post it on Slack. Then maybe you can download it from there. Okay. Thank you. Please. Sorry about this. Uh, it's just not letting me share the slides. Okay, have you seen these uh, slides? Just going to. Okay, um, do you have any problem like sharing, like uh, sending the slides? Otherwise we'll go to a video directly. Yeah, I just uploaded them to Slack. Okay. I don't uh, know they... which, which channel? The, our ICP S2 GPUs channel. Okay, I can see it. Just one second. So I will you... share your slides and you can uh, like uh, ask me to go to the next slide, okay? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, sorry about this confusion. So sorry everyone for this delay. Um, okay. I think, uh... Okay, yeah, you can go ahead. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, uh, sorry about this delay. Uh, and thanks for uh, attending this talk. So today I'll be presenting uh, briefly uh, our work exploring the use of spatial accelerators in scientific applications. Basically, this is a hardware software co design uh, framework which we have developed here at Pacific Northwest National Labs. Uh, so this work is in collaboration with my co-author, Roberto Goyosa at Pacific Northwest National Labs. Can you go to the next slide? So we are in a, in a golden uh, age of computer architecture. Uh, every day, uh, not every day, like we, we, we see a lot of uh, uh, fancy machine learning based accelerators, uh, 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 we saw prevalence of GPUs used in HPC, uh, and now we can uh, uh, probably see something similar 
coming from the machine learning domain being used in HPC. So we want to see what can a, a kind of a benefit these accelerators can give to scientific applications in the HPC domain and other uh, domains such as graph applications as well. Uh, so what we want to see is how, what, what the benefits these accelerators can give uh, to uh, applications. Uh, and we want to do a sort of a quick hardware software co-design uh, uh, and come up with a pro, uh, estimate of a performance benefit for these applications. Uh, and at the same time, this is complex because your uh, hardware systems will have multiple accelerators uh, and then they might have uh, multiple run times and uh, you'll have some resource contention. So we want to estimate everything uh, thing as much as possible. The, once we have a, a good performance estimation, the idea is that I think I cannot hear anymore. Can anyone hear this? Uh, no. I'm, I'm afraid we lost the connection to him. Maybe it's better to move the next talk to the front and yeah, yeah, this yeah. one figure out the his technical okay. issues. Okay, so I want to ask uh, for the next speaker. Uh, so for next paper, is a speaker ready? Uh, yeah, um, we we'll think the uh, offline. So can you play the video? So we are available to answer question online. Okay, okay, so we will play your video. Okay, I will stop sharing. Hello? Hello, I'm, I'm going to the next, the next talk. Sorry, and for because we have this delay, so we have to go to the next talk. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, maybe yeah. we will have a, a final QA session for your talk at the end. Yeah, 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 I understand. Thank you. Hello, I am Wilson, and today I'm joined with my colleague Xu Chai. We are from Huawei Technologies. Today we will be. I just want to make sure everyone can see this video, right? Works and sound yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Thanks. I will start from the And I'm joined with my colleague Xu Chai. We are from Huawei Technologies. Today we will be presenting our paper on extending Sickle's programming paradigm with tensor based SIMD abstractions. So we have a few key highlights that we want to talk about, starting off with the front end language extensions, followed by the custom compilation tool chain, followed by the custom LLVM optimization passes we have implemented. And last, we will talk about some of the brief benchmark overviews that we are currently experimenting with. Okay. For the language extension, we extend the tensor concept by adding shape, stride, coordinate, address space information to the tensor definition. There are two special tensor concepts. Uh, one is the local tensor, the other is the virtual tensor. Local tensor means the compiler will maintain the tensor. Virtual tensor actually is a view of the original tensor. A uh, virtual tensor will share the same memory of the original tensor. We also defined, uh, we also support several formats of the tensor, such as big N, small Z, big Z, small Z. We define the behavior of the tensor of assignment uh, among global tensor, local tensor, and virtual tensor. Uh, we also support tensor member operation uh, slice. This slice operation will return the virtual subtensor from the original tensor. Uh, we uh, define the tensor and
is called matrix multiplication operation. This is a hardware accelerated operation. Uh, besides that, we also support the tensor copy operation, TCPI, TCPO, TMove. All these uh, operations are responsible for moving tensor from global memory to the uh, user buffer. So in order to support both the SQL language along with our custom tensor extensions, we have implemented a custom tool chain inside Bisheng LVM's client driver. This does both the parsing and also semantic checking for the SQL part along with our tensor extensions. The output of this component as shown in the blue is then LVM IR with tensor intrinsic instructions. This is then passed into the custom and also proprietary ascend LVM compiler, where we do a selection of optimizations, starting off with generic scalar optimizations, and then followed by the custom intrinsic transformations into ascend target specifics. And then that, of course, is passed into the back end where it gets converted into a binary. Okay, for the RLVM optimization passes, we introduced a uh, three core data structure tensor context, tensor table, tensor graph. The tensor context is a model level singleton class which contains a tensor table and a tensor graph. Tensor table uh, collects all the tensor related information inside the function, and uh, this tensor graph collects uh, CFT related information on the tensor. Uh, for example, like the instruction, insertion, position. Uh, we create one uh, transformation pass. We call it the uh, all-in-one transform uh, pass. This transform pass will do the actual uh, OP lowering, uh, address allocation, synchronization, double buffering work. And uh, this transform pass uh, requires the analysis pass. Uh, we need to get the uh, analysis, uh, analysis results, uh, such as uh, def use analysis, Lovelace, uh, OP lowering analysis, address allocation, synchronization, double buffer analysis results for the transform pass. All the uh, pass dependency are demonstrated on the right hand side uh, picture. So we have a variety of different benchmarks currently written using SQL along with this tensor extension. Just to name a few that would include general matrix multiply, and also lower upper inverse matrix compute. Both of these benchmarks use the single construct, single task, and parallel four. This is to demonstrate the ability that it can distribute and partition data into parallel cores, and that we have shown that the performance gains when using more cores is beneficial. However, it will also require more fine tuning. This is for future work. And so this concludes our presentation. Thank you for your time. For more details, please refer to the paper itself. It's Chen Ming, a postgraduate student from Shanghai Jiao Tong University in China. It's a great honor to introduce our work over subscribing. Sorry, uh, like, uh, yeah, I think uh, this uh, is the end of this, uh, this, 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 this talk. So I, Anyone, do anyone have questions about this, this work? So first I, I, will, I will ask uh, uh, one, one question. I think uh, i make sure I stop sharing. Yeah. So I can I ask uh, a question that, uh, can you discuss on the application scenarios uh, especially existing and the future scenarios of this extension and also its associated advantages of this application of this extension for these applications oh you, you, uh, so that's good questions you are uh, you are talking about uh, the actual uh, application level right so yeah. uh, right now we uh, we we focus first uh, we focus on the maximum application first and uh, Afterwards, we already uh, passed this uh, 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 the 
language detection on Runnet 50 already. We already got some uh, uh, bench, uh, results already. And uh, in the next step, we would like to start a more uh, current uh, network. And uh, right now, I think we test the first, uh, if I remember correctly, and also run at uh, net uh, 50. That's two uh, network we already supporting. And uh, we are going to support more. So it may take some time for us. Thank you. Thank you for, your, for answering the question. Um, uh, any any other questions from the audience? You can post your questions on Slack, or you can raise your hand and uh, just uh, ask your question in voice. Okay. So can I ask uh, another question? Uh, yeah. Yeah. How can, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, can can you discuss uh, uh, the, the 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 overall this uh, uh, advantage of this uh, uh, this uh, this uh, this basic uh, asynchronous asynchronous program programming paradigm over like uh, the normal oh. or traditional programming paradigm? What is what is the advantage? Okay, yeah. Uh, since we provided the higher level uh, uh, concept of uh, tensor, so user can use this concept uh, 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 tensor to write the program as, as they uh, would like to. And uh, uh, actually, in over compiler level, we need to handle several things. Uh, for example, because of the, in the uh, lower level, the hardware implementation is uh, a synchronized uh, uh, hardware. So we need to handle the uh, synchronization for the user. So in that case, the user don't need to worry about the synchronization. We, the compiler will handle it for them. The second thing, the, there are some uh, hardware optimization opportunities uh, available. For example, the double buffer. So hardware can provide the uh, read memory and the write, write memory at the same time. So uh, you, we, uh, compiler will help the user to implement this uh, uh, double buffer to improve, improve the performance for the user. So in, in that case, so user will uh, can simplify their code by using the tensor concept and at the same time they can get a better performance. Okay, uh, okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your, for your summarization. Uh, if there's uh, no other questions from the audience, I think we, we have some time left for, uh, for, for, for Rizwan for your first work, uh, for first paper. Uh, so we have six minutes. Do you want to use this six minutes to briefly discuss your paper? You can either present or like, uh, uh, or like just uh, verbally discuss your paper. Are you still here, Rizwan? Yeah, I'm here. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. You have six minutes. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I can. I guess uh, if uh, I can verbally present my work, right? Uh, oh, yeah, that'd be great. Just, yeah. 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 So. What we have done is we have developed a uh, hardware software code design framework, essentially, uh, where we have developed a sort of a simulated uh, device, uh, OpenCL device, uh, based on top of a Pokal library. So this simulated device where is you can say, OK, uh, I'm going to model this hardware accelerator. For example, you want to do some sort of a gem accelerator, right? You go to a off-the-shelf hardware simulator and say, uh, use something like Aladdin or use something like an uh, NVIDIA's tool like Time Loop. Uh, you go to that framework and say uh, simulator, and then get performance numbers from for your uh, hardware accelerator. So you could go ahead and say, okay, I'm going to do a 64 by 64 gem, and I'm going to have multiple of these 64 by 64 gem accelerators. Uh, I'm going to run a simulation and see how much of this uh, time is going to be consumed by this 64 by 64 gem. Then I have this simulated device as shown in this slide, uh, Proteus. Uh, so that uh, I plug in these performance numbers into this Proteus device. And then this is instantiated in, in this system as an OpenCL device and visible as a, at the system level. Uh, 
once you have this setup, uh, uh, you have this device up and visible, and it is emulating this hardware accelerator, uh, then you can go ahead and use this programming model uh, and a runtime scheduler known as Minos Computing Library, MCL, which sits on, on top of this. So its job is to see what are the available resources and then uh, map tasks onto the available hardware accelerators. And on top of that, it is also a programming model, asynchronous pro programming model, uh, which can be uh, used to program these devices. Uh, and a typical design flow uh, here would look like this, where you'll have multiple apps uh, at the top and you find a common set of kernels. You take these kernels to different hardware accelerator simulators and you get performance numbers for your kernels. And then you set up your runtime environment in terms of setting up a, a device, a system setup, and then you run this, uh, this uh, MCL scheduler and you run these multiple apps and what you get is you get performance estimates for these apps, right? Uh, once you have these performance estimates, you can reiterate it even at this step where, uh, at the last step where you can set up different number of compute units, for example, in, inside of a hardware accelerator, or even you can go back to the hardware accelerator simulator step and reiterate different designs, for example, trying different number of P's and so on so forth, because that will affect your performance. Yeah, can you uh, jump to the next slide, I guess? So what this gives you is, is performance estimates. So this is just an example of how you would uh, go ahead and use MCL-based asynchronous task-based programming model to program these devices. Uh, and uh, we can jump to the next slide, I guess. And this is, for example, an example of using a hardware accelerator simulator, something like Aladdin, uh, where you try to see, okay, if I want to do a gem, how many cycles will it take? So this is just an example uh, where there is a loop which is written in C level code. So we this this is the kernel we want to accelerate. So we get an LLVM IR trace, and from that we get this uh, data dependent graph. So we are telling Aladdin, okay, we want to unroll the loop two times in this case. So the loop is unrolled two times. And at the end of the day, what is what we get is how many number of cycles it will take to uh, perform this compute given a workload. Uh, so we can use these uh, latency numbers uh, in our experiments in the Proteus device. And I guess we can jump to the result slide. Uh, or or we can jump to the experiment. Yeah, next slide. So we, we get these, we get these and we set up the environment uh, and we can run these experiments. So in this case, we run multiple applications uh, of, uh, from graph and HPC domains. The idea being, okay, you have these multiple kernels like gem or sparse mat matrix, sparse matrix multiplication or sparse matrix vector multiplication. Uh, and we're accelerating these kernels in hardware uh, in the in this Proteus device. Sorry next, to interrupt. You need to conclude your pay, your presentation. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next, next slide. Just uh, yeah, next slide. So in this case, we are comparing against a pure GPU-based system, uh, where the idea is if okay, we have eight GPUs. What if we replace four of the GPUs with these uh, custom accelerators? Uh, what kind of a performance gain would be gained as compared to this pure GPU-based system? So we can jump to the result slide and then to the conclusions. So this is a result slide. So this is uh, giving the performance benefit for multiple applications. Again, uh, CCSD is a computer, uh, computation chemistry uh, uh, application from HPC. Triangle coding BFS and graphs are from uh, uh, graph domains. Uh, and these are sparse, the la last three applications sparse. So this is a dense application. So this is end-to-end -end application. So this is an important point here that you can get end-to-end -end application accounting for Amdo's law, like what is uh, uh, the overheads of uh, transferring the data 
also accounting for what is the performance of running something on the host side as well and accounting for all the system uh, over uh, system software overhead and all those things so we can jump to the conclusion slide So essentially, this is a, a, a coupled simulation method methodology where uh, next generation designs are uh, basically simulated, uh, driven by uh, the developers and the manner. Uh, you can get different designs easily. Uh, it I think uh, I can wait. the connection uh, is not stable. It's not stable. So let's stop here. And uh, so we don't have time for this uh, yeah. discussion QA. So we can continue this uh, discussion uh, in Slack channel. Okay. So let's go to our next uh, next speaker. Uh, so our next presentation uh, has a title: Overscribing, Oversubscribing GPU Unified Virtual Memory Implementations and uh, Suggestions. So let's welcome. Our next speaker, please uh, speak up. Oh, <clears throat> hello, can you hear me? Uh, I, I would like to use the pre-recorded video as the presentation. So you want to use play the YouTube video, right? Uh, yes. Okay. So you want to play yourself or? I will play um, myself. Okay, thanks. is Chen a postgraduate student from Shanghai Jiao Tong University in China. It's a great honor to introduce our work over subscribing GPU unified memory implications and suggestions. This paper is a uh, characterization of GPU unified oversubscription. I hope it can be helpful. This presentation is divided into four parts. First, the introduction and the background material can help you have a grasp of this field. Next, the experimental methodology and the results is given. Uh, due to its unique features, now GPU is used as a general purpose processor to accelerate many tasks, and it can often outperform CPU. It is widely used in many fields, for example, in AI, graph computing, statistics, and etc. However, the memory capacity of GPU is limited. This picture shows the main global memory uh, in a GPU board. The onboard memory of a GPU is insufficient, especially for many data-intensive applications. As we can see from the table, as the computing resources in GPU models evolve rapidly over the years, the size of the memory does not catch up as expected. To overcome the shortage of memory, GPU manufacturers provided UVM. UVM establishes a unified address space between CPU and GPU and hides the details of the data migration behind programmers. It has many advantages. First, as the figure shows, it simplified GPU programming. Second, memory oversubscription is supported. Uh, this means a GPU can access more memory than the GPU physical memory. It can support memory sharing between multiple GPUs also. Uh, many works studied UVM, but they failed to make uh, uh, deep analysis to reveal the diversity in the trend of uh, performance degradation as oversubscription aggravates progressively, nor the impact of performance tuning strategies on the oversubscription, nor the possibility of utilizing UVM to implement multi GPU computation. Therefore, we are here. This paper investigates these three important topics. In each level, we analyze and uh, offer targeted principles and uh, recommendations that can help developers to design more efficient and uh, robust UVM programs. Uh, 
a workflow of a CUDA program is built up by CPU serial code and GPU kernels. To invoke a kernel, the data should first be copied from main memory to GPU. After the kernel finishes, the result is copied back to main memory. Therefore, data duplication is needed. Uh, under UVM, the data is shared by both GPU and CPU. The data is organized into pages. When a processor access data, the corresponding pages is moved from one device to the processor, and the page table is updated automatically. This figure demonstrates a detailed file fault handling process. And to help developers to do fine performance tunings, CUDA provides some APIs. They are, pre they are prefetching and uh, data movement devices. Prefetching uh, asynchronously fetch data beforehand. When the advice, uh, while the advices tell the driver what the access pattern of the data is. For example, it is read-only data or mostly accessed by one device or moves between devices frequently. Uh, and this helps the memory manager to better arrange the data. Here is our main idea. We select a wide range of uh, representative applications. First, we investigate how uh, UVM oversubscription affects aff uh, applications' performance in detail. Next, we combine UVM applications uh, UVM over subscription with performance tuning methods and multi GPU. Here is our benchmarks selected. They can come from widely used benchmark use, and we modified them to our UVM programming model. Uh, and to quantify the degree of over subscription, um, we put forward a concept that, uh, of uh, Oversubscription ratio. When no oversubscription, the ratio is zero. The more oversubscription, the larger the ratio is. Uh, this figure shows the application's e execution, ex execution time as oversubscription ratio increases. Ob obviously, they are different. We can see that applications in C, the curve remains stable, while in A and B, we can observe that, uh, very interesting, the curve keeps uh, steady at first, but after a specific ratio, the ex execution time have a sudden and a dramatic increase. We, we refer to the ratio as uh, the launch ratio. Also, the ratio is different for different uh, applications. For example, it's 2 for 2 mm. And the difference in launch ratio between applications reflects their sensitivity to oversubscription. The larger the ratio is, the application is more sensitive to oversubscription. Uh, and these figures display the pattern of their page faults both the time and the page, page, page when page faults occur. Uh, under oversubscription, the size of the overall data site is beyond the capacity of the GPU memory at high oversubscription ratios. <laughs> the working set excesses GPU memory Thus, GPU swaps pages to main memory. When the data needs to be accessed again, the page will be moved to GPU again. Thus, some page may fault multiple times, as uh, you can see from here. And the fault pages shows a line-like segmented pattern. We also found that each segment is corresponded to a separate data structure of uh, the application. 
<coughs> here we take GMM as an example. GMM is simple, it does matrix uh, multiplication as shown in the figure. It has three segments uh, corresponds to A, B, and C from high to low. We can see the number of pages of uh, page segments of B grows as the uh, ratio increases. Although each element in A, B, and C is accessed once, the order is of the accessing is different, which Sorry leads that, to wait, different wait, wait, wait. page fault numbers. For A wait, and wait, C, wait, wait, um, uh, the elements are accessed row-wise, but B is accessed column-wise. And the irregularity of memory access makes pages in P more likely to fault. I, 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 and the pages I that have similar access it, patterns to uh, with B in GM could uh, frequently trigger page fault. And we refer to them as so four pages remaining uh, because the video, but I don't have time to show that. So you can refer yeah, to the YouTube. <laughs> Yeah, so there's a video in the YouTube. We I think uh, because we have only ten minutes for presentation. Okay, oh, so we need okay. to yeah. They, yeah, do you can you like uh, uh, so if you give you one minute, can you briefly like uh, summarize uh, the things that we haven't covered yet, or, or that over? Yeah, so one minute to uh, briefly. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, for now, we covered the first part of the experiment, and the next uh, one at the uh, uh, characterization of the prefetching and hints uh, of, of UVM. And the next one is uh, the, uh, the, the implications of using multiple GPU and its performance. Um, so only the first uh, part is, uh, is show. And, uh, and th this is, uh, It, single mm -hmm. GPU system, even with those computation. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, Chuan Ming. I so, I, if you have any questions uh, about this uh, uh, about Chuan Ming's uh, talk, please uh, either raise your hand or post your question uh, in the Slack channel. Okay. Like as to start with, I want to ask uh, uh, Chuan Ming uh, so one question. Um, my question is, uh, can you share with us like, how often are GPU UVM overscribing used in practice? And what are the normal practical overscribing ratios based on your understanding, your experience? So uh, as far as I know, only some uh, researchers are using this technique. And uh, in the industry, it is not used uh, widely because some of uh, uh, because uh, sometimes it can be very detrimental to the performance uh, to the performance of the application. So there are many uh, characterization of this technique, but uh, many things are uh, unknown now. So. It is, has some potential to be widely used in the future. So yeah. then, why, why, why do the research uh, use this uh, UVM subscription? Uh, so, what's the purpose? Can okay. you share with us? So, why the industry is not using, why the research uh, field is using this? Uh, mm. Mm -hmm. Some. Uh, some people are using this uh, uh, technology because it can uh, make your application use larger memory than the GPU has. So uh, like some uh, graph computing workloads, because the graph is large, it is larger than, than a GPU can hold. So using UVM, it can potentially uh, make your application to uh, you uh, to compute uh, the, the larger graph, um, but it can be sometimes uh, hurts your application's performance. So this is uh, uh, some 
you can you 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 need to seek the balance between performance and uh, and the memory. Okay, thank you, thank you, Kevin, for your for answering the questions. I think uh, uh, it's time to, to go to the next talk. So oh, okay. our, thank you. So our next talk will be given by Rico. Uh, will give by Rico um, uh, Van Steek, and he's here, um, and his title will be. Uh, isolating isolating GPU architectural features using py parallelism aware micro uh, micro benchmarks. Uh, uh, please go ahead, Rico. So, uh, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Good. Then I'll uh, share my screen. So, can uh, everyone see the slides? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Looks good. So uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Rico and I will be uh, presenting our work on isolating GPU architectural features using parallelism aware micro benchmarks. So why do we think this is important? So every generation, extensive architectural changes are implemented in GPUs. These can range from core design to memory architecture to scheduling changes or even special features such as tensor cores. So this is great, but uh, what we don't always know is what kind of impact this has on performance and how we should apply these features. So that's what we focused on in our work. And we focus this around the main research question of how can the architectural differences between devices from different generations be evaluated and exploited. So I will be covering uh, how we are going to evaluate this. Uh, I'll give a brief architectural overview on GPUs. Uh, I will cover our results on memory architecture. Uh, for the results on tensor cores and arithmetic peak performance, you should uh, read our paper since we do not have enough time for that. And finally, I will give some concluding remarks. So our evaluation methodology. So we try to adhere to the same workflow for each architectural feature we investigate. So first, we try to isolate these features using micro benchmarks, if possible, existing micro benchmarks. Then we want to parallelize the micro benchmarks to take uh, full uh, use of the GPU. And as well, we want to use a fine-grained time methodology to gain better insight into our results. So for our work, we use three different generations of NVIDIA GPUs. We use the GTX 1080 Ti from the Pascal generation, the RTX 2080 Ti from the Turing generation, and the A100 from the Ampere uh, generation. So a brief architectural overview on the GPU. So GPUs are highly parallel. Uh, so in NVIDIA's case, they consist of many SMs. Uh, and then globally, there's also uh, these SMs are connected to a global memory and uh, an L2 cache. And as well, there are some additional I.O., for instance, to communicate with the uh, CPU. And then these SM, SMs actually uh, consist of the uh, processing units. So they contain the load store units, the processing elements for integer or floating point calculation uh, for, uh, from the Volta architecture. And later, there are tensor cores. And as well, there's per SM, there's a, an L1 cache, a texture cache, and a shared memory. So how do we program these uh, the GPUs? Well, we use NVIDIA's own uh, programming, language, uh, programming model, uh, CUDA, uh, which in concept is very similar to that of the GPU where there's a hierarchy. Uh, so each execution kernel you execute in CUDA consists of blocks, and then each block consists of warps, and each warp consists of 32 threads. And as well, CUDA allows relatively low level access to hardware, so we can query on which SM a thread is running. Uh, we can read hardware times for our uh, accurate measurements. And we can use the shared memory to quickly store readings without influencing the execution too much. So the memory architecture. So uh, the devices we use, they uh, utilize a different L1 cache architecture. So on Pascal, uh, texture and L1 cache are combined, whereas in Turing and Ampere, the shared memory and L1 cache are combined. Uh, so this is, uh, according to NVIDIA, this should uh, decrease latency. Uh, as well, there are different L2 size and different main memory speed, but we will primarily focus on the L1 cache. It should be noted that uh, you can uh, choose how much L1 cache you want on Turing and Ampere. Uh, for all our experiments, we used uh, 30, 32 kilobytes, and uh, Pascal has uh, 48 kilobytes in the card we used. So uh, our first... Uh, um, our experiments, uh, we base these uh, on existing papers. Uh, but we do know that these existing papers utilize very little parallelism. So we uh, attempt to extend these micro benchmarks to use multiple warps or multiple blocks. And then we want to use timers per warp to uh, uncover scheduling characteristics. So we'll start with latency measurements and then we move on to bandwidth. 
So uh, we based on an existing pointer tracing method, which uh, uses a single thread using strided axis on a buffer. And then for each axis, we'd measure the time. And then the buffer size is gradually increased until we start to see L1 misses. And using this method, we can find specific characteristics such as the uh, L1 cache size, uh, the cache hit latency, and perhaps even an indication of the cache eviction strategy. So these are in initial results. Uh, for the GTX 1080 Ti, we see that uh, the latency starts to increase at 24 kilobytes, even though it should have 48 kilobytes of cache uh, per SM. Uh, we'll uh, get to that later. And then for during an ampere, we actually see uh, it starts to increase roughly at uh, 22 and 25 kilobytes, uh, but we do not see uh, an increase in levels as we had seen with Pascal. Uh, rather, it has a more uh, gradual incline, uh, which tells us that perhaps the eviction strategy, strategy is different. So there's no uh, least recently used uh, strategy, but something more sophisticated. And we all see that on Ampere, the uh, latency is slightly lower across the board uh, at the end, but it does start to rise a bit sooner. So now we want to move this uh, micro benchmark to uh, an entire SM. So we uh, uh, start multiple warps on a single block, and we use one active thread per warp, and we let each thread access the same data. So in an ideal world, world because it's the same data, we would expect no performance impact because all of the data can be reused. And we ensure the buffer is small enough to fit in L1. So uh, our baseline uh, on the uh, GTX 1080 Ti takes roughly 25,000 cycles. But what happens if we run 32 threads? We actually see that it takes much longer. So the quickest uh, threads now take nearly 40,000 cycles. So we see there's really uh, some clear contention going on. And we all see that some when some threads finish, uh, based on this curve, we can see that some threads also speed up because there's uh, more room on the SM. So how does this compare to during an ampere? So again, we have a baseline of roughly 25,000 cycles. But what we see here is that on Turing, the impact is already reduced quite a lot. And on the ampere, it's almost gone. Uh, so the individual threads are very similar to each other. There's still uh, a few thousand cycle penalty from running uh, 32 uh, blo uh, blocks or warps at the same time. But it's not nowhere near as uh, drastic as, well, as we've seen on Pascal. So now we uh, change our experiment to use multiple blocks instead of multiple warps. And then we want to see uh, how do these uh, blocks uh, influence each other, uh, in this case, uh, on L1 cache contention. So we again use one active thread per block. Uh, each thread accesses different data in this case. And we ensure that the per block buffer is small enough to fit in L1 once. So we should see interference if they run uh, or if multiple run on the same SM. So uh, again, a baseline on Pascal, we see roughly you know, 110 cycle uh, latency. But when we add a second block, we actually see no influence whatsoever. So again, this, this indicates to us that the SM of Pascal uh, consists of two halves, uh, which uh, operate uh, without interfering with each other. And when we add a third block here, we actually see that uh, two blocks are interfering with each other, but the other block is uh, unaffected. So how does this compare to during an ampere? Again, we have a baseline of roughly 90 cycles of latency. But as soon as we add a second block, we immediately start to see a lot of contention. So this is a clear difference between Pascal and Ampere and Turing. So what we see across the board is that Pascal has a higher hit latency and that uh, Turing and Ampere use uh, some sort of different non-least recently used eviction scheme. As well, we see that the contention on an SM becomes much smaller and we uh, have some indication that Pascal has some sort of split SM design, whereas during the Ampere show, the expected behavior. So moving on to bandwidth, we again base our approach on an existing paper. Uh, blocks consisting of multiple warps accesses all of the elements in a buffer, and we ensure that all buffers on an SM should fit in L1 cache. So we note some inconsistencies in the existing method. So they use uh, different data types, 32-bit uh, or 64-bit floating points. So we, uh, we opted to use both as well as different instructions. Uh, so we uh, opted to use a move instruction, a negate instruction, and add instruction. As well, we, and we use our fine-grained time methodology to uh, get some uh, scheduling behavior. So 
what we see in this graph is the scheduling behavior. So each line represents a, a single uh, warp, and then each color in, uh, represents a single block. So we see here one block uh, with 32 uh, warps. So we see this takes roughly 15 cycles to complete on Pascal. So when we add a second block, we see that these actually run at the same time, uh, and they both take roughly 15,000 cycles. When we start four blocks, we actually see that these uh, execute in pairs. So we see the first two blocks uh, operate uh, between 0 and 15,000 cycles, and then uh, later we see the other uh, blocks start to operate. So again, we have a baseline for Turing and Ampere, uh, very similar behavior to Pascal in this case. But here, uh, when we add a second block to Turing, uh, it actually just executes later, uh, whereas on Ampere, uh, two blocks are started at the same time, but only a single one can uh, immediately execute. And this is because the Ampere card we used uh, actually allows for more resident threads on the SM. So uh, how does this relate back to our uh, initial question? How can the architectural difference between device and different generation be evaluated and exploited? So, we have made some interesting observations. So the split assembly design on Pascal, uh, the new affixion policy, and we can see differences in level of contention. Uh, but what's less clear is how we should apply this to the real world. So this was still a bit of an open question. We did find that uh, it is very important to pick suitable parameters. So use sensible block size and to utilize cache and processing elements efficiently. And use a number of blocks that's equal to a multiple of the number of SMs available on the GPU. And this also tells us that we should make applications tunable based on architectural features. So don't hard code any kernel parameters. So this was the end of my presentation. Uh, for more information, uh, you can read our paper and the source code is also available on my GitHub. So uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Rico. I uh, think for pre presentation, we have a couple of questions. We will leave the most interesting one at the end. So we will ask uh, first, uh, uh, Manu, do you want to ask your question by yourself? Sure. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Am I audible? Uh, yeah, I, you, you, I can't really understand you too well. Am, am I audible? Uh, yes. 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 All right. Uh, my question is: you, your measurement seems to be taken in clock cycles. So, have you, have you done some kind of simulation, or how did you make these measurements? Yeah, so we ran this on uh, actual hardware. So uh, the CUDA actually exposes uh, an API to uh, read out clock cycles, uh, which we then export to shared memory, which is very low latency and has no, uh, it has limited effect on uh, the actual execution. So we can actually uh, obtain really accurate uh, clock cycle measurements without uh, interfering with our computation too much. All right, thanks. So we have a question from Philip. Uh, you want to ask yourself? So. Yeah, my the question they ask in, in Slack is more joke, but I have a real question as well. <laughs> so I, but it's kind of related in a way. So uh, my my question is: so obviously the people who do a lot of GPU benchmarking are two communities: the, the machine learning and to some extent Bitcoin people and the PC gamers. So did you did you kind of relate your findings to you know, what many hardware websites publish in terms of, you know, performance differences between different architectures? Yeah, I think that's still a bit of an open problem. So we really went into architectural features. So it's, it's still quite difficult, uh, I think, to apply this to real world mm -hmm. um, applications. So for my thesis, I actually uh, also attempted this method on uh, metrics metric multiplication. So both for the CUDA course and the tensor core. And we found some uh, factors which did apply to both the micro benchmark and the uh, uh, actual uh, metric metric multiplication, but not everything. So uh, more research would be necessary for this, I think. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Rico. And uh, uh, I did not get to keep the Ampere GPU. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks. Uh, I think uh, we, we need to conclude this session. Thank you, everyone. So I want to ask uh, the speakers to, to join our Slack channel, SAPE 2020 S2 GPUs, and uh, to share your slides, either link to your paper or a PDF. 
And uh, so we'll also encourage uh, discussions uh, in a slide to continue, okay? So, so we have a next session in five minutes, uh, 11.05 is a poster and a demo session, and we will have a break for like four to five minutes. Thank you everyone for attending this session. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks to the session chair as well. Thank you. So we have a few minutes of break, and then Christoph is going to introduce the post and demo session to us in four minutes from now. Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Christoph, your ICPE logo is flipped. Is it? Yes. You need to, there, there is, when you, when you, when you import a background, there is an option that says mirror your, your background or something like this, or mirror your image. <laughs> now it's interesting because I mirrored my screen on, it looks correct on my side, but it, like on my screen, but apparently it doesn't for everyone else. It's fine. It just looks a little funny. <laughs> So maybe now it should look good for you guys. Um, could the uh, presenters of the posters briefly uh, turn on their cameras and let me know who they are? Oh, Andre, okay. Hi. Shinshi, hi. Okay, I saw you guys. Hi. Uh, all right, so there's only a couple Hi, missing. Hi, Chetan here. Hey. Hey, hey. Hi. Yeah, this is Diksha for HS profi Profiler. Hi, this is Kim Long. Hi, this is Alex. Those of the speakers who have prepared slides for their demonstrations and have not shared them in the Slack channel, please go ahead and do this as well, so that people who cannot join the session or cannot join the introduction can at least see the slides. Thanks. All right, I guess we'll start now. So welcome all uh, to the last session of today's first day of ICP 2022. It's gonna be the posters and demonstrations. Um, really happy that you're all here. And this is gonna be a slightly different session. Um, I and then we were the, the, the track chairs and session co-chairs. So briefly before we start into everything, I wanna introduce the process that we're gonna follow this year. We'll have seven posters and demos. Um, 
in the beginning. So right after I've, I've finished speaking, we're gonna hear one to two minute pitches of what the individual presenters will demo to you today. And then we'll have one breakout room per presenter, per poster or demo, uh, where all the audience can then join whichever room they are interested in. And we'll also have an additional breakout room for casual chats and social interaction. Um, I think the, the most important message for, for this, um, for this session is be kind um, and let's make this all together an interactive session and so that everyone gets enough feedback uh, on their work. So what we have this year, we have um, four accepted dedicated posters and demo submissions. And then we invited also three um, demos that have accepted artifacts from research or industry tracks. And with this, I'm gonna, we, so we're gonna go um, from top to bottom with the, with the pitches and I'm gonna invite for the first paper, I think it's Andre, to unmute yourself and pitch. Yeah. Uh, I cannot share my screen. You have at first to close your screen. Or should I only tell something? Uh, no, like quickly a minute, what, you, what uh, you're gonna do. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. Um, I think the title says everything. So I'm part of a spec research and we founded last year a new uh, working group that is about predictive data analytics. And I would like to give a short overview about the group, what we're doing and so on. This is in everything, basically. All right. Thank you. So the next presenter, Tisha, please. Yeah. Hello, everyone, and welcome to my demo presentation on HLS Profiler, a non-intrusive profiling tool for HLS-based applications. I'm Diksha, and I'm from TCS Research. HLS Profiler is based on HLS compilers. The motivation behind this tool is since HLS compilers analyze the concurrency in an algorithm and generate RTL, that can be implemented on FPGA using high level language, but it is not necessary that generated RTL is most optimized one. To further tune the design, users should have the idea of bottlenecks in their source code. For this, HLS compilers provide overall latency of source code along with cycle count at the loop or sub function level, but not at the line level, which is useful for bottleneck identification. To aid this, we have developed a HLS profiler tool that will provide bottleneck information along with extent of parallelism and line-by-line -line association of kernel and performance that, in that enables performance accounting at the lowest level of granularity. These advantages helps the user to understand the operation scheduling of target design so that user can further tune the performance of their source code. With this, I'm ending my pitch and invite all of you to the live demo of HLS profiler. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so the third demo is going to be about Maple. If you can briefly pitch your, your yeah. demo. Right. This is Chetan from the uh, TCS research. Uh, what I'm going to uh, present is the Maple. That is a model aggregation and prediction for a learner ecosystem. So what is Maple? Maple is a tool that allows user to build and visualize their AI workflows and estimate the performance and the cost for various on-premises, hybrid cloud and server-based deployment. So uh, in short, uh, we have a multiple uh, 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 models to database like performance and cost database for different ML and DL models uh, incorporated, incorporated in our database. We use that data to predict the cost and the performance number that is execution time uh, for the end-to-end -end application. Then we have a um, capacity planning in terms of what if and if what scenarios. And also it supports the uh, multiple cloud and also the multi cloud deployment of the various uh, MLDL models for your end application. So uh, that is what about the Nepal. Welcome you all to the uh, breakout room. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the fourth demo about the spec HPC benchmark suite. Um, yeah, hey, uh, this is Junjie Lee. Um, I'm part of the SPAC High Performance Group. And in this demo, we will talk about the SPAC HPC 2021 benchmark. 
Uh, this benchmark is the latest benchmark developed by the Spike High Performance Group. Uh, it was released uh, just a, a few months ago. Uh, the benchmark is designed to gauge performance of modern HPC systems, uh, especially systems with uh, heterogeneity, with GPUs or other type of accelerators. Um, in this demo, we will talk about some of the basic features of the benchmark. Uh, check out the published results on the SPEC website uh, and see how you can adopt the benchmark in your own performance-related research. Uh, looking forward to see you guys in the demo session. Thank you very much. And the poster demo number five. Yes, hello, my name is Stefan Kålen and uh, this is, will be our artifact connected to our paper, which we'll present at the end of Wednesday. Uh, and uh, here we'll present the SMP tool, which can be used to analyze the SSF models. We present their stochastic state flow models. Uh, and uh, yeah, this tool can be used to perform different analysis, such as uh, transient analysis to compute, for, for example, what's the probability of this system, of us having a system failure after some limited time and also sensitivity analysis to see what part of the models are actually affecting the, the system failure probability the most. Uh, so yeah, this is what I will present. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. So the sixth demo. Hi, uh, this is Kim Long from um, um, York University, Canada. Um, so uh, in this uh, paper, we demonstrate the, um, uh, eval the evaluation of the scalability and elasticity of function as a service. So as we know, FAS uh, offer auto scaling. So we would like to uh, benchmark and measure how good is this auto scaling is and what are the, um, uh, the pattern behind the scaling uh, strategy by each cloud providers. And um, uh, we also formulate another research question to uh, specialize in the, the behavior of FAS when they has reached the saturation level uh, where it has reached to the maximum number of uh, instances it can spawn. So in that way, we can uh, examine the performance at that uh, saturation point, as well as we uh, suggest a, a pattern to improve the, um, um, the, the effectiveness of the system when it has reached to the um, the uh, saturation point. So in this demo, I also share the uh, code base that uh, we implemented uh, our solution, the workload smoother. Uh, so I'm looking forward to um, meeting each of you in the uh, breakout room. Yeah. Thank you very much. And the final poster demo that we have for today, Alex. Hi everyone, my name is Alex Baluda and I'm also from York University. Uh, in our work, uh, machine learning based interference modeling, uh, we investigate performance interference caused by resource contention and cloud native applications. And we employ various strategies to model the impact of performance interference on an application. In uh, my demo, I'll be detailing the scripts that we use to do so, to uh, model performance interference. So I'll go through an example of that. Uh, and I'll also talk about how uh, we can further extend the set of scripts to evaluate additional strategies. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks a lot. So these are our is our exciting uh, agenda that we have for today. Um, just a quick overview for everyone, and I uh, will uh, open the breakout rooms in a second. And everyone is free to move to the breakout rooms they are interested in. And I would invite also the authors to move to the one that they are um, assigned to. Basically, thanks a lot, and have fun. So you should be able to move to the breakout rooms now. Hi, Christoph, I don't see the breakout rooms. 
there should be a button on the bottom. I see only um, participants share my screen, live transcript, and reactions. Same here. Yeah. Same here. Breakout rooms say unassigned. Are these breakout rooms that you need to manually assign, or are these? Oh, they were pre. Okay, let me. Now the unassigned is gone, so I'm assuming Nico fixed something. <laughs> Maybe you can try again. Yeah. But now it says all breakout room will close in 45 seconds. So that's awesome. I'm very sorry for that. I'll wait for the breakout rooms to close and then I will open them again so that everyone can freely. Okay. Now it's gone. Someone open them now. Can you now move around or still no? Can you move into the breakout rooms or right now? I still don't see them. Okay. It doesn't look like it. So I mean, okay, so I to... managed to get into breakout room one, but I'm not sure. So to all the hosts, I'm closing in them and reopening them. Okay, so please don't interfere with that. Christoph, do you see the under the option? Um, yes. Um, um, yeah, I just just a second. Are breakout rooms enabled in the master page? So I think I see it now. Yes. Ah, oh, yes, good. we got I'm it. I'm sorry for this hiccup. Um, please go ahead now and enjoy the demos. Yeah. And in the main room, you can see my, you can see the overview, right? Okay, so. Yes. Okay, good. Then I will leave it like that so that people know where to go if they kind of missed the introduction. Or jumping.
Uh, hi, I'm not sure how to get into any of those breakout rooms because I'm not seeing those links on my uh, Zoom app. Uh, any idea how to get into the breakout rooms? So the best is to, to ask Nico, but if you tell me which one you want to go, I can also assign you, I think. Okay, so then... Uh, if there's a specific one you want to join, I can, I can just send you over. If you just want to learn how to move around, it's best to ask Nico. <laughs> All right, can you send me to HLS Profiler then? Uh, is this, which one is this? The HLS Profiler, that's the demo. Uh, the second one, second room. Yes. Okay. Let me try to assign you the third one. So I think there should now be a pop-up, right? Yeah. 